When Day is Done by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson When day is done and the night slips down And I've turned my back on the busy town And come once more to the welcome gate Where the roses nod and the children wait I tell myself as I see them smile That life is good and its tasks worth while when day is done and I've come once more to my quiet street in the friendly door, where the mother reigns and the children play and the kettle sings in the old-time way, I throw my coat on a nearby chair and say farewell to my pack of care. When day is done, all the hurt and strife and the selfishness and the greed of life are left behind in the busy town. I cease to worry about renown or gold or fame and i'm just a dad content to be with his girl and lad whatever the day has brought of care here love and laughter are mine to share here i can claim what the rich desire rest and peace by a ruddy fire the welcome words which the loved ones speak and the soft caress of a baby's cheek when day is done and i reach my gate i come to a realm where there is no hate for here, whatever my worth may be, are those who cling to their faith in me, and with love on guard at my humble door, I have all that the world has struggled for. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Simple Things by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Olivia I would not be too wise, so very wise, that I must sneer at simple songs and creeds, and let the glare of wisdom blind my eyes to humble people and their humble needs. I would not care to climb so high that I could never hear the children at their play, could only see the people passing by, and never hear the cheering words they say. I would not know too much, too much to smile at trivial errors of the heart and hand, nor be too proud to play the friend the while, nor cease to help and know and understand. I would not care to sit upon a throne or build my house upon a mountain top, where I must dwell in glory all alone and never friend come in or poor man stop. God grant that I may live upon this earth and face the tasks which every morning brings, and never lose the glory and the worth of humble service and the simple things. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Life is What We Make of It by Edgar A. Guest Read for a LibriVox dot org by m lee life is a jest take the delight of it laughter is best sing through the night of it swiftly the tear and the hurt and the ache of it find us down here life must be what we make of it life is a song dance to the thrill of it grief's hours are long and cold is the chill of it Joy is man's need, let us smile for the sake of it. This be our creed, life must be what we make of it. Life is a soul, the virtue and vice of it. Strife for a goal, and man's strength is the price of it. Your life and mine, the bare bread and the cake of it. And in this line, life must be what we make of it. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. We were sitting there and smoking of our pops, discussing things like liquor votes for women and the tottering thrones of kings, when he ups and strokes his whiskers with his hand and says to me, changing laws and legislators ain't as fur as I can see gonna make this world much better unless somehow we can find a way to make a better and a finer sort of man 
The trouble ain't with statues or with systems, not at all. It's with humans just like we, airing their petty ways and small. We could stop our written law books and our regulating rules if a better sort of manhood was the product of our schools. For the things that we air needn't ain't no written from a pen or bigger guns to shoot with but a bigger type of men. I reckon all these problems air just ornery like the weeds. They grow in soil that ought to nourish only decent deeds. And they waste our time and fret us when, if we were thinking straight and living right, they wouldn't be so terrible and great. A good horse needs no snaffle, and a good man, I opine, doesn't need a law to check him or to force him into line. If we ever start in teaching to our children year by year how to live with one another, there'll be less of trouble here. If we teach them how to neighbor and to walk in honor's ways, we could settle every problem which the mind o' man can raise. What we're needing isn't systems or some regulating plan, but a bigger and a finer and a truer type of man. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Boy and His Dad by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Hayden C. A boy and his dad on a fishing trip. There is a glorious fellowship. Father and son in the open sky, and the white clouds lazily drifting by, and the laughing stream as it runs along with a clicking reel like a martial song, and the father teaching the youngster gay how to land a fish in the sportsman's way. I fancy I hear them talking there, in an open boat, and a speech is fair, and the boy is learning the ways of men, from the finest man in his youthful ken. Kings to the youngster cannot compare with the gentle father who's with him there, and the greatest mind of the human race not for one minute could take his place. Which is happier, man or boy? The soul of the father is steeped in joy, for he's finding out to his heart's delight that his son is fit for the future fight. He is learning the glorious depths of him and the thoughts he thinks in his every whim, and he shall discover when night comes on how close he has grown to his little son. A boy and his dad on a fishing trip. Oh, I envy them as I see them there, under the open sky and the open air, for out of the old, old long ago come the summer days that I used to know, when I learned life's truths from my father's lips, as I shared the joy of his fishing trips, builders of life's companionship. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. If I Had Youth by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Hayden C. If I Had Youth I'd bid the world to try me. I'd answer every challenge to my will, and though the silent mountains should defy me, I'd try to make them subject to my skill. I'd keep my dreams and follow where they led me. I'd glory in the hazards which abound. I'd eat the simple fare privations fed me, and gladly make my couch upon the ground. If I had youth, I'd ask no odds of distance, nor wish to tread the known and level ways. I'd want to meet and master strong resistance, and in a worthwhile struggle spend my days. I'd see the task which calls for full endeavor. I'd feel the thrill of battle in my veins. I'd bear my burden gallantly, and never desert the hills to walk on common plains. If I had youth, no thought of failure lurking beyond tomorrow's dawn should fright my soul. Let failure strike it still should find me working with faith that I should some day reach my goal. I'd dice with danger, ay, and glory in it. I'd make high stakes the purpose of my throw. I'd risk for much, and should I fail to win it, I would not ever whimper at the blow. If I had youth, no chains of fear should bind me. I'd brave the heights which older men must shun. I'd leave the well-worn lanes of life behind me and seek to do what men have never done. Rich prizes wait for those who do not waver. The world needs men to battle for the truth. 
calls each hour for stronger hearts and braver. This is the age for those who still have youth. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Looking Back by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Hayden C. I might have been rich if I'd wanted the gold instead of the friendships I've made. I might have had fame if I'd sought for renown in the hours when I purposely played. Now, I'm standing today on the far edge of life, and I'm just looking backward to see what I've done with the years and the days that were mine and all that has happened to me. I haven't built much of a fortune to leave to those who carry my name, and nothing I've done shall entitle me now to a place on the tablets of fame. But I've loved the great sky and its spaces of blue. I've lived with the birds and the trees. I've turned from the splendor of silver and gold to share in such pleasures as these. I've given my time to the children who came. Together we've romped and we've played. That I wouldn't exchange the glad hours spent with them for the money that I might have made. I chose to be known and be loved by the few, and was deaf to the plaudits of men. And I'd make the same choice should the chance come to me to live my life over again. I've lived with my friends, and I've shared in their joys, known sorrow with all its tears. I've harvested much from my acres of life, though some say I've squandered my years. For much that is fine has been mine to enjoy, and I think I've lived to my best. And I have no regret, as I'm nearing the end, for the gold that I might have possessed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. God Made This Day For Me by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Jonathan Gary. Just the sort of weather, just the sort of sky, which seemed to suit my fancy, with white clouds drifting by, on a sea of smooth and blue water. Oh, I ain't an egotist, with an eye in all my thinking, but I'm a willing to insist that the Lord who made us humans and the birds in every tree knows my special sort of weather and he made this day for me this is just my style of weather sunshine flooding all the place and the breezes from the eastward blowing gently on my face and the woods chock full of singing till you think birds never had a single care to fret em or grief to make em sad. Oh, I'd settle down contented in the shadow of a tree and tell myself right proudly that the day was made for me. It's my day, my sky and sunshine, and the temper o' oh, the breeze. Here's the weather I would fashion could I run things as I please. Beauty dancing all around me, Music ringing everywhere, like a wedding celebration. Why, I plumb forgot my care. And the tasks I should be doing for the rainy days to be. While I'm hugging the delusion that God made this day for me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Great Fire by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Samson Speaks I'm sorry for a fellow if he cannot look and see In a great fire's friendly flaming all the joys which used to be If in quiet contemplation of a cheerful ruddy blaze He sees nothing there recalling all his happy yesterdays Then his mind is dead to fancy and his life is bleak and bare And he's doomed to walk the highways that are always thick with care when the logs are dry as tinder and they crackle with the heat and the sparks like merry children come a dance and round my feet in the cold long nights of autumn i can sit before the blaze and watch a panorama born of all my yesterdays i can leave the present burdens and the moment's bit of woe and claim once more the gladness of the bygone long ago 
No loved ones ever vanish from the great fire's merry throng. No hands in death are folded and no lips are still to song. All the friends who were are living like the sparks that fly about. They come romping out to greet me with the same old merry shout. Till it seems to me I'm playing once again on boyhood stage where there's no such thing as sorrow and there's no such thing as age. I can be the carefree schoolboy. I can play the lover too. I can walk through Maytime orchards with the old sweetheart I knew. I can dream the glad dreams over, greet the old familiar friends, in a land where there's no parting and the laughter never ends. All the gladness life has given from a great fire I reclaim, and I'm sorry for the fellow who sees nothing there but flame. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Homely Man by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Carrie Adams Your Book Voice Looks as though a cyclone hit him, Can't buy clothes that seem to fit him, And his cheeks are rough like leather, Made for standin' any weather. Outwards he was fashioned plainly, Loose a joint and blamed ungainly. But I'd give a lot if I'd been built half as fine inside. Best thing I can tell you of him is the way the children love him. Now and then I get to thinkin' he's much like old Abe Lincoln. Homely as a gargoyle graven, worse'n that when he's unshaven. But I'd take his ugly fizz just to have a heart like his. I ain't over sentimental. But old Blake is so blamed gentle and so thoughtful like of others, he reminds us of our mothers. Rough roads he is always smoothin', and his way is oh so soothin', that he takes away the sting when your heart is sorrowing. Children gather round about him like they can't get on without him, and the old depend upon him, piling all their burdens on him like as though the thing that grieves him has been lifted when he leaves him. Homely? That can't be denied. But he's glorious inside. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Joys We Miss by Edgar A. Guest, read for LibriVox.org by Samson Speaks. There never comes a lonely day but that we miss the laughing ways of those who used to walk with us through all our happy yesterdays. We seldom miss the earthly great, the famous men that life has known, but as the years go racing by, we miss the friends we used to own. The chair wherein he used to sit recalls the kindly father true, for oh so filled with fun he was, and oh so very much he knew. And as we face the problems grave with which the years of life are filled, we miss the hand which guided us and miss the voice forever stilled. We little guessed how much he did to smooth our pathway day by day, how much of joy he brought to us, how much of care he brushed away. But now that we must tread alone the thoroughfare of life, we find how many burdens we were spared by him who was so brave and kind. Death robs the living, not the dead. They sweetly sleep, whose tasks are done. But we are weaker than before, who still must live and labor on. For when come care and grief to us, and heavy burdens bring us woe, we miss the smiling, helpful friends on whom we leaned long years ago. We miss the happy, tender ways of those who brought us mirth and cheer. We never gather round the hearth but that we wish our friends were near. For peace is born of simpler things, a kindly word, a good night kiss, the prattle of a babe in love, these are the vanished joys we miss. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Fellowship of Books by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Krista Zaleski The Fellowship of Books I care not who the man may be, nor how his tasks may fret him, nor where he fares, nor how his cares and troubles may beset him. If books have won the love of him, whatever fortune hands him, he'll always own, when he's alone, a friend who understands him. Though other friends may come and go, and some may stoop to treason, his books remain through loss or gain, and season after season the faithful friends for every mood 
his joy and sorrow sharing. For old time's sake they'll lighter make the burdens he is bearing. Oh, he has counsel at his side and wisdom for his duty, and laughter gay for hours of play and tenderness and beauty, and fellowship divinely rare, true friends who never doubt him, unchanging love and God above, who keeps good books about him. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. When Sorrow Comes by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Jared Hansen When sorrow comes, as come it must, In God a man must place his trust. There is no power in mortal speech The anguish of his soul to reach. No voice, however sweet and low, Can comfort him or ease the blow. He cannot from his fellow men Take strength that will sustain him then, With all that kindly hands will do, And all that love may offer too. He must believe throughout the test that God has willed it for the best. We who would be his friends are dumb, words from our lips but feebly come. We feel as we extend our hands that one power only understands and truly knows the reason why so beautiful a soul must die. We realize how helpless, then, are all the gifts of mortal men. No words which we have power to say can take the sting of grief away. That power which marks the sparrow's fall must comfort and sustain us all. When sorrow comes, as come it must, in God a man must place his trust. With all the wealth which he may own, he cannot meet the test alone. And only he may stand serene, who has a faith on which to lean. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Golf Luck by Edgar A. Guest. Read for LibriVox.org by Jared Hansen. As a golfer, I'm not one who cops the money. I shall always be a member of the dubs. There are times my style is positively funny. I am awkward in my handling of the clubs. I am not a skilled golfer, nor a plucky. But this about myself I proudly say. When I win a hole by freaky stroke or lucky, I never claimed I played the shot that way. There are times, despite my blundering behavior, when fortune seems to follow at my heels. Now and then I play supremely in her favor, and she lets me pull the rankest sort of steals. She'll give to me the friendliest assistance. I'll jump a ditch at times when I should not. I'll top the ball and get a lot of distance, but I don't claim that's how I played the shot. I've hooked a ball when just that hook I needed, and wondered how I ever turned the trick. I've thanked my luck for what a friendly tree did, although my fortune made my rival sick. Sometimes my shots turn out just as I planned them, the sort of shots I usually play. But when up to the cup I chanced to land them, I never claimed I played them just that way. There's little in my game that will commend me. I'm not a shark who shoots the course in par. I need good fortune often to befriend me. I have my faults and know just what they are. I play golf in a desperate do-or-die way, and into traps and trouble oft I stray. But when by chance the breaks are coming my way... I do not claim I played the shots that way. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Contradictin' Joe by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Jared Hansen Heard of Contradictin' Joe? Most contrary man I know, always saying that's not so. Nothing's ever said but he steps right up to disagree, quarrelsome as he can be. If you start in to recite all the details of a fight, he'll butt in and set you right. Start a story that is true, he'll begin correcting you, make you out a liar too. Mention time of year or day, makes no difference what you say, nothing happened just that way. Bet you when his soul takes flight and the angels talk at night, he'll butt in to set him right. There where none should have complaints, he will be with no's and ain'ts, contradicting all the saints. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Better Job by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Meliora Dockery If I were running a factory, I'd stick up a sign for all to see. I'd print it large and I'd nail it high on every wall that the men walked by. 
I'd have it carry this sentence clear. The better job that you want is here. It's the common trait of the human race to pack up and roam from place to place. Men have done it for ages and do it now, seeking to better themselves somehow. They quit their posts and their tools they drop for a better job, in a better shop. It may be I'm wrong, but I hold to this, that something surely must be amiss when a man worth while must move away for the better job, with the better pay. And something is false in our own renown when men can think of a better town. So if I were running a factory, I'd stick up this sign for all to see, which never an eye in the place could miss. There isn't a better town than this. You need not go wandering far or near. The better job that you want is here. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. My Religion by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson My religion's love and God, who made us one and all, Who marks, no matter where it be, the humble sparrows fall. And my religion's serving him the very best I can, By not despising anything he made, especially man. It's love and sky and earth and sun and birds and flowers and trees, but loving human beings more than any one of these. I ain't no hand at preaching, and I can't expound the creeds. I fancy every fellow's faith must satisfy his needs, or he would hunt for something else. And I can't tell the why and wherefore of the doctrines deep, and what's more I don't try. I reckon when this life is done, and we can know his plan, God won't be hard on anyone who's tried to be a man. My religion doesn't hinge on some one right or word. I hold that any honest prayer a mortal makes is heard. To love a church is well enough, but some get cold with pride, and quite forget their fellow men for whom the Saviour died. I fancy he best worships God when all is said and done, who tries to be from day to day a friend to everyone. If God can mark the sparrow's fall, I don't believe he'll fail to notice us and how we act when doubts and fears assail. I think he'll hold what's in our hearts above what's in our creeds, and judge all our religion here by our recorded deeds. And since man is God's greatest work since life on earth began, he'll get to heaven, I believe, who helps his fellow man. In the poem. This recording is in the public domain. What I Call Living by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Kale Yuhani The miser thinks he's living when he's hoarding up his gold. The soldier calls it living when he's doing something bold. The sailor thinks it living to be tossed upon the sea. And upon this vital subject no two of us agree. But I hold to the opinion, as I walk my way along, that living's made of laughter and good fellowship and song. I wouldn't call it living always to be seeking gold, to bank all the present gladness for the days when I'll be old. I wouldn't call it living to spend all my strength for fame, and forego the many pleasures which today are mine to claim. I wouldn't for the splendor of the world set out to roam, and forsake my laughing children and the peace I know at home. Oh, the thing that I call living isn't gold or fame at all. It's good fellowship and sunshine, and it's roses by the wall. It's evenings glad with music, and a hearth fire that's ablaze. And the joys which come to mortals in a thousand different ways. It is laughter and contentment and the struggle for a goal. It is everything that's needful in the shaping of a soul. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. If This Were All by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Kaylee Honey If this were all of life will know, If this brief space of breath were all there is to human toil, If death were really death, and never should the soul arise a finer world to see, How foolish would our struggles seem, how grim the earth would be, 
If living were the whole of life, to end in seventy years, how pitiful its joys would seem, how idle all its tears. There'd be no faith to keep us true, no hope to keep us strong, and only fools would cherish dreams. No smile would last for long. How purposeless the strife would be if there were nothing more, if there were not a plan to serve, an end to struggle for, no reason for a mortal's birth except to have him die. How silly all the goals would seem for which men bravely try. There must be something after death. Behind the toil of man there must exist a god divine who's working out a plan. And this brief journey that we know as life must really be the gateway to a finer world that some day we shall see. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Christmas Carol by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson God bless you all this Christmas day, and drive the cares and griefs away. O oh, may the shining Bethlehem star, which led the wise men from afar, upon your heads, good sirs, still glow to light the path that ye should go. As God once blessed the stable grim, and made it radiant for him, as it was fit to shield his son, may thy roof be a holy one. May all who come this house to share rest sweetly in his gracious care. Within thy walls may peace abide, the peace for which the Saviour died. Though humble be the rafters here, above them may the stars shine clear. And in this home thou lovest well, may excellence of spirit dwell. God bless you all this Christmas day. May Bethlehem star still light thy way, and guide thee to the perfect peace, when every fear and doubt shall cease. And may thy home such glory know as did the stable long ago. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Forgotten Boyhood by Edgar A. Guest. Read for LibriVox.org by James N. He wears a long and solemn face and drives the children from his place. He doesn't like to hear them shout, or race and run and romp about, and if they chance to climb his tree, he is as ugly as can be. If in his yard they drive a ball, which near his purdy flower should fall, he hides the leather sphere away, thus hoping to prevent their play. The youngsters worry him a lot, this sorry man who has forgot, that once upon a time he too the self-same mischief used to do. The boyhood he has left behind has strangely vanished from his mind, and he is old and gray and cross for having suffered such a loss. He thinks he never had the joy that is the birthright of a boy. He has forgotten how he ran or to a dog's tail tied a can, broke window panes and loved to swipe some neighbor's apples red and ripe. He thinks that always, day or night, his conduct was exactly right, and boys today he cannot see the youngster that he used to be. Forgotten is that bygone day when he was mischievous as they. Poor man, I'm sorry for your lot, the best of life you have forgot. Could you remember what you were, unharnessed and untouched by spur? These youngsters that you drive away would be your comrades here today. Among them you could gaily walk and share their laughter and their talk. You could be young and blithe as they, could you recall your yesterday. End a poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Peaks of Valor by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Kayla Yuhani. These are the peaks of valor, keeping clean your father's name. Too brave for petty profit to risk the brand of shame. Adventuring for the future, yet mindful of the past. For God, for country and for home, still valorous to the last. These are the peaks of valor, a speech that knows no lie. A standard of what's right and wrong, which no man's wealth can buy. 
all unafraid of failure, to venture forth to fight, yet never for the victory's sake to turn away from right. Ten thousand times the victor is he who fails to win, who could have worn the conqueror's crown by stooping low in sin. Ten thousand times the braver is he who turns away and scorns to crush a weaker man, that he may roll the day. These are the peaks of valor, standing firm and standing true, to the best your father taught you and the best you've learned anew. Helpful to all who need you, winning what joys you can, writing in triumph to the end your record as a man. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. When the Minister Calls by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Stan Hargrove My pa says that it used to be, whenever the minister came for tea, that they sat up straight in their chairs at night and put all their common things out of sight. And nobody cracked a joke or grinned, but they talked of the way that people sinned, and the burning fires that would cook you sure when you came to die if you wasn't pure. Such a gloomy affair it used to be whenever the minister came for tea. But now, when the minister comes to call, I get him out for a game of ball, and you'd never know if you'd seen him bat without any coat or vest or hat that he is a minister, no siree, he looks like a regular man to me. And he knows just how to go down to the dirt for the grounders hot without getting hurt. And when they call us, both him and me have to get washed up again for tea. Our minister says, if you just play fair, you'll be fit for heaven or anywhere. And fun's all right if your hands are clean and you never cheat and you don't get mean. He says that he has never understood why a feller can't play and still be good. And my pa says that he's just the kind of a minister that he likes to find. So I'm always tickled as I can be whenever our minister comes for tea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Age of Ink by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra The Age of Ink Swiftly the changes come each day sees some lost beauty blown away, and some new touch of lovely grace come into life to take its place. The little babe that once we had, one morning woke a roguish lad. The babe that we had put to bed, out of our arms and lives, had fled. Frocks vanished from our castle then, ne'er to be worn or seen again and in his knickerbocker pride he boasted pockets at each side and stored them deep with various things, stones, tops and jacks and coloured strings. Then for a time we claimed the joy of calling him our little boy. Brief was the reign of such a spell. One morning sounded out a bell. With tears I saw her brown eyes swim and knew that it was calling him. Time the harsh master of us all was bidding him to heed his call. This shadow fell across life's pool. Our boy was on his way to school. Our little boy. And still we dreamed for such a little boy he seemed. And yesterday with eyes aglow like one who has just come to know some great and unexpected bliss, he bounded in, announcing this. Oh, Dad! Oh, Ma! Say, what do you think? This year we're going to write with ink. Here was a change I'd not foreseen, another step from what had been. I paused a little while to think about this older age of ink. What follows this great step, thought I? What next shall come as the time goes by? And something said, His pathway leads unto the day he'll write with deeds. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. No Use Sighing by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox by Doty No use sighing No use fretting when the rain comes down No use grieving when the gray clouds frown 
No use sighing when the wind blows strong. No use wailing when the world's all wrong. Only thing that a man can do is work and wait till the sky gets blue. No use moping when you lose the game. No use sobbing if you're free from shame. No use crying when the harm is done. Just keep on trying and working on. Only thing for a man to do is take the loss and begin anew. No use weeping when the milk is spilled. No use growling when your hopes are killed. No use kicking when the lightning strikes or the floods come along and wreck your dikes. Only thing for a man right then is to grit his teeth and start again. For it's how life is and the way things are that you've got to face if you travel far. And the storms will come and the failures too. And plans go wrong spite of all you do. And the only thing that will help you win is the grit of a man and a stern set chin. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. No Children by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox by Dodie No children in the house to play It must be hard to live that way I wonder what the people do When night comes on and the work is through With no glad little folks to shout No eager feet to race about No youthful tongues to chatter on About the joy that's been and gone The house might be a castle fine but what a lonely place to dine. No children in the house at all, no finger marks upon the wall, no corner where the toys are piled, sure indication of a child. No little lips to breathe the prayer that God shall keep you in his care. No glad caress and welcome sweet when night returns you to your street. No little lips a kiss to give. Oh, what a lonely way to live. No children in the house, I fear we could not stand it half a year. What would we talk about at night, plan for, and work with all our might? Hold common dreams about and find true union of heart and mind. If we too had no greater care than what we both should eat and wear. We never knew love's brightest flame until the day the baby came. And now we could not get along without their laughter and their song. Joy is not bottled on a shelf, it cannot feed upon itself. And even love, if it shall wear, must find its happiness in care. Dull we'd become of mind and speech had we no little ones to teach. No children in the house to play, oh, we could never live that way. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Loss Is Not So Great by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Kayla Yuhani It is better as it is. I have failed, but I can sleep. Though the pit I now am in is very dark and deep, I can walk tomorrow's streets and can meet tomorrow's men, unashamed to face their gaze as I go to work again. I have lost the hope I had. In the dust are all my dreams. But my loss is not so great or so dreadful as it seems. I made my fight, and though I failed, I need not slink away, for I do not have to fear what another man may say. They may call me overbold, they may say that I was frail. They may tell I dared too much and was doomed at last to fail. They may talk my battle over and discuss it as they choose, but I did no brother wrong. I'm the only one to lose. It is better as it is. I have kept my self-respect. I can walk tomorrow's streets, meaning all men had erect. No man can charge his loss to a pledge I did not keep. I have no shame to regret. I have failed, but I can sleep. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dan McGann Declares Himself by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Krista Zaleski Said Dan McGann to a foreign man who worked at the selfsame bench, Let me tell you this, and for emphasis he flourished a Stilson wrench. Don't talk to me of the bourgeoisie, don't open your mouth to speak. Of your socialists or your anarchists, don't mention the Bolshevik. For I've had enough of this foreign stuff, I'm sick as a man can be of the speech of hate, and I'm telling you straight that this is the land for me. 
If you want to brag, just take that flag and boast of its field of blue, and praise the dead and the blood they shed for the peace of the likes of you. Enough you've raved, and once more he waved his wrench in a forceful way. Oh, the cunning creed of some Russian breed, I stand for the USA. I'm done with your fads and your wild-eyed lads, don't flourish your rag of red. Where I can see, or by night there'll be, tall candles around your bed. So tip your hat to a flag like that, thank God for its stripes and stars. Thank God you're here where the roads are clear, away from your kings and czars. I can't just say what I feel today, for I'm not a talking man. But first and last I'm standing fast for all that's American. So don't you speak of the Bolshevik, I'm sick of that stuff I am. One God, one flag is the creed I brag, I'm boostin' for Uncle Sam. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Boy in His Stomach by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Lee Vogler What's the matter with you? Ain't I always been your friend? Ain't I been a partner to you? All my pennies don't I spend in getting nice things for you? Don't I give you lots of cake? Say, stomach, what's the matter that you had to go and ache? Why, I loaded you with good things yesterday. I gave you more potatoes, squash, and turkey than you'd ever had before. I gave you nuts and candy, pumpkin pie, and chocolate cake. And last night when I got to bed, you had to go and ache. Say, what's the matter with you? Ain't you satisfied at all? I gave you all you wanted. You was hard just like a ball. And you couldn't hold another bit of pudding yet last night. You ached most awful stomach. That ain't treating me just right. I've been a friend to you, I have. Why ain't you a friend of mine? They gave me castor oil last night because you made me whine. I'm awful sick this morning and I'm feeling mighty blue because you don't appreciate the things I do for you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Home and the Office by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Kayla Yuhani Home is the place where the laughter should ring and man should be found at his best. Let the cares of the day be as great as they may, the night has been fashioned for rest. So leave at the door when the toiling is o'er, all the burdens of work time behind, and just be a dad to your girl or your lad, a dad of the rollicking kind. The office is made for the tasks you must face, it is built for the work you must do. You may sit there and sigh as your cares pile up high, and no one may criticize you. You may worry and fret as you think of your debt, you may grumble when plans go astray, but when it comes night and you shut your desk tight, don't carry the burdens away. Keep daytime for toil and the nighttime for play. Work as hard as you choose in the town. But when the day ends and the darkness descends, just forget that you're wearing a frown. Go home with a smile, oh, you'll find it worthwhile. Go home light of heart and of mind. Go home and be glad that you're loved as a dad, a dad of the fun-loving kind. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. He's Taken Out His Papers by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Kayla Yuhani He's taken out his papers, and he's just like you and me. He's sworn to love the stars and stripes and die for it, says he. And he's done with dukes and princes, and he's done with kings and queens, and he's pledged himself to freedom, for he knows what freedom means. He's bought himself a bit of ground, and lord, he's proud and glad, for in the land he came from, that is what he never had. Now his kids can beat his writing and their reading books, says he, that the children in his country never get a chance to see. He's taken out his papers, and he's prouder than a king. It means a lot to me, says he, just like the breath of spring. For a new life lies before us. We've got hope and faith and cheer. We can face the future bravely, and our kids don't need to fear. He's taken out his papers, and his step is light today. For a load is off his shoulders, and he treads an easier way. And he'll tell you, if you ask him, so that you can understand, just what freedom means to people who have known some other land. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Castor Oil by Edgar A. Guest, read for LibriVox.org by Lee Vogler. I don't mind lickings now and then, and I can even stand it when my mother calls me in from play to run some errand right away. There's things about being just a boy that ain't all happiness and joy, but I suppose I got to stand my share of trouble in this land, and I ain't kicking much but say, the worst of parents is that they don't realize just how they spoil a feller's life with castor oil of all the awful stuff gee whiz that's the very worst there is and every time if i complain or say i've got a little pain there's nothing else that they can think except castor oil for me to drink i notice though when pa is ill that he gets fixed up with a pill and pa don't handle mother rough and make her swallow nasty stuff. But when I've got a little ache, it's castor oil I've got to take. I don't mind going up to bed before I get the chapter read. I don't mind being scolded, too, for lots of things I didn't do. But, gee, I hate it when they say, Come, swallow this, and right away. Let poets sing about the joy it is to be a little boy. I'll tell the truth about my case. The poets here can have my place, and I will take their life of toil if they will take my castor oil. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Father's Wish by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Jonathan Gary What do I want my boy to be? Oft is the question asked of me, and oft I ask it of myself, what corner, niche, or post, or shelf. In the great hall of life would I select for him to occupy, statesman or writer, poet, sage, or toiler for a weekly wage, artist or artisan, oh, what, is to become his future lot. For him I do not dare to plan, I only hope he'll be a man. I leave it free for him to choose the tools of life which he shall use, brush, pen, or chisel, lathe, or wrench, the desk of commerce, or the bench, and pray that when he makes his choice, in each day's task he shall rejoice. I know somewhere there is a need for him to labor and succeed. Somewhere, if he be clean and true, loyal and honest through and through, he shall be fit for any clan, and so I'll hope he'll be a man. I would not build my hope or ask that he shall do some certain task or bend his will to suit my own. He shall select his post alone. Life needs a thousand kinds of men, toilers and masters of the pen, Doctors, mechanics, sturdy hands, to do the work which it commands. And whosoever he pleased to go, honor and triumph he may know. Therefore I must do all I can to teach my boy to be a man. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. No Better Land Than This by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee If I knew a better country in this glorious world today, Where a man's work hours are shorter and he's drawing bigger pay, If the Briton or the Frenchman had an easier life than mine, I'd pack my goods this minute and I'd sail across the brine. But I notice when an alien wants a land of hope and cheer and a future for his children, he comes out and settles here. Here's the glorious land of freedom, here's the milk and honey goal for the peasant out of Russia, for the long subjected Pole. It is here the sons of Italy and men of Austria turn for the comfort of their bodies and the wages they can earn. And with all that men complain of and with all that goes amiss, there's no happier, better nation on the world's broad face than this. So I'm thinking when I listen to the wails of discontent and some foreign disbeliever spreads his evil sentiment, 
that the breed of hate and envy that is sowing sin and shame in this glorious land of freedom should go back from whence it came and i hold it is the duty rich or poor of every man who enjoys this country's bounty to be all american end of poem this recording is in the public domain a boy and his dog by edgar a guest read for LibriVox.org by krista zaleski a boy and his dog a boy and his dog make a glorious pair no better friendship is found anywhere for they talk and they walk and they run and they play and they have their deep secrets for many a day and that boy has a comrade who thinks and who feels who walks down the road with a dog at his heels he may go where he will and his dog will be there may revel in mud and his dog will not care faithful he'll stay for the slightest command and bark with delight at the touch of his hand oh he owns a treasure which nobody steals who walks down the road with a dog at his heels no other can lure him away from his side he's proof against riches and station and pride fine dress does not charm him and flattery's breath is lost on the dog for he's faithful to death he sees the great soul which the body conceals. Oh, it's great to be young with a dog at your heels. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Wait till your pa comes home by Edgar A. Guest. Read for LibriVox.org by Carrie Adams. Your book voice. Wait till your pa comes home. Oh, dear, what a dreadful threat for a boy to hear. Yet never a boy of three or four but has heard it a thousand times or more. Wait till your pa comes home, my lad, and see what you'll get for being bad. Wait till your pa comes home, you scamp. You've soiled the walls with your finger stamp. You've tracked the floor with your muddy feet and fought with a boy across the street. You've torn your clothes and you look a sight, but wait till your pa comes home tonight. Now, since I'm the pa of that daily threat, which paints me as black as a thing of jet, I rise in protest right here to say, I won't be used in so fierce a way. No child of mine in the evening gloom shall be afraid of my coming home. I want him waiting for me at night with eyes that glisten with real delight. When it's right that punished my boy should be, I don't want the job postponed for me. I want to come home to a round of joy, and not to frighten a little boy. Wait till your pa comes home. Oh, dear, what a dreadful threat for a boy to hear. Yet that is ever his mother's way of saving herself from a bitter day, and well she knows in the evening gloom he won't be hurt when his pa comes home. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Nothing to Laugh At by Edgar A. Guest. Read for LibriVox.org by Lee Vogler. Tain't nothing to laugh at, as I can see. If you'd been stung by a bumblebee, and your nose was swelled and it smarted too, you wouldn't want people to laugh at you. If you had a lump that was full of fire, like you'd been touched by a red-hot wire, and your nose spread out like a load of hay, you wouldn't want strangers who come your way to ask you to let them see the place and laugh at you right before your face. What's funny about it, I'd like to know. It isn't a joke to be herded so. And how was I ever on earth to tell at the pretty flower which I stooped to smell? In our back yard was the very one which a bee was busily working on. And just as I got my nose down there, he lifted his foot and kicked for fair. And he planted a stinger right into me, but it's nothing to laugh at as I can see. I let out a yell and my maw came out to see what the trouble was all about. She says from my shriek she was sure that I 
had been struck by a motor car passing by, but when she found what the matter was, she laughed just like everybody does, and she made me stand while she poked about to pull this terrible stinger out. And my pa laughed too when he looked at me, but it's nothing to laugh at as I can see. My ma put witch hazel on the spot to take down the swelling, but it has not. It seems to get bigger as time goes by, and I can't see good out of this one eye, and it hurts clean down to my very toes whenever I got to blow my nose, and all I can say is when this gets well, there ain't any flowers I'll stoop to smell. I'm through disturbing a bumblebee, but it's nothing to laugh at as I can see. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. No Room for Hate by Edgar A. Guest. Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee. We have room for the man with an honest dream, with his heart on fire and his eyes agleam. We have room for the man with a purpose true, who comes to our shores to start life anew. But we haven't an inch of space for him who comes to plot against life and limb. We have room for the man who will learn our ways, who will stand by our flag in its troubled days. We have room for the man who will till the soil, who will give his hands to a fair day's toil. But we haven't an inch of space to spare for the breeder of hatred and black despair. We have room for the man who will neighbor here, who will keep his hands and his conscience clear. We have room for the man who will respect our laws and pledge himself to our country's cause. But we haven't an inch of land to give to the alien breed that will alien live. Against the vicious we bar the gate. This is no breeding ground for hate. This is the land of the brave and free, and such we pray it shall always be. We have room for men who will love our flag, but not for the friends of the scarlet rag. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Boy and the Flag by Edgar A. Guest. Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee. I want my boy to love his home, his mother, yes, and me. I want him wheresoe'er he'll roam, with us in thought to be. I want him to love what is fine, nor let his standards drag. But, oh, I want that boy of mine to love his country's flag. I want him when he older grows to love all things of earth, and oh, I want him when he knows to choose the things of worth. I want him to the heights to climb, nor let ambition lag, but oh, I want him all the time to love his country's flag. I want my boy to know the best. I want him to be great. I want him in life's distant west, prepared for any fate. I want him to be simple, too, though clever, ne'er to brag. But, oh, I want him, through and through, to love his country's flag. I want my boy to be a man, and yet in distant years, I pray that he'll have eyes that can not quite keep back the tears. When, coming from some foreign shore, and alien scenes that fag, born on its native breeze once more, he sees his country's flag. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Too Big a Price by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Kathy Kay they say my boy is bad, she said to me, a tired old woman, thin and very frail. 
They caught him robbing railroad cars, and he must spend from five to seven years in jail. His pa and I had hoped so much for him. He was so pretty as a little boy. Her eyes with tears grew very wet and dim. Now nothing that we've got can give us joy. What is it that you own, I questioned then. The house we live in, slowly she replied. Two other houses worked in slave for when the boy was but a youngster at my side. Some bonds we took the time he went to war. I've spent my strength against the want of age. We've always had some end to struggle for. Now shame and ruin smear the final page. His pa has been a steady-going man, worked day and night and overtime as well. He's lived and dreamed and sweated to his plan, to own the house and profit should we sell. He never drank nor played much cards at night. He's been a worker since our wedding day. He's lived his life to what he knows is right. And why should son of his now go astray? I've rubbed my years away on scrubbing boards, washed floors for women that owned less than we, and while they played the ladies and the lords, we smiled and dreamed of happiness to be. And all this time, where was the boy, said I? Out some were playing, like a rifle shot. The thought went home. My God, she gave a cry. We paid too big a price for what we got. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Always Sighing Down by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Lee Vogler Folks are queer as they can be Always saying don't to me Don't do this and don't do that Don't annoy or tease the cat Don't throw stones or climb a tree don't play in the road, oh, gee, seems like when I want to play, don't is all that they can say. If I start to have some fun, someone hollers, don't you run. If I want to go and play, mother says, don't go away. Seems my life is filled clear through with things I mustn't do. All the time I'm shouted at, no, no, sonny, don't do that. Don't shout so and make a noise. Don't go play with those naughty boys. Don't eat candy, don't eat pie. Don't you laugh and don't you cry. Don't stand up and don't you fall. Don't do anything at all. Seems to me both night and day, don't is all that they can say. When I'm older in my ways and I have little boys to raise, bet I'll let them race and run and not always spoil their fun. I'm not telling them all along everything they like is wrong. And you bet your life I won't all the time be saying don't. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Boy of Mine by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Boy of Mine, Boy of Mine, this is my prayer for you. This is my dream and my thought and my care for you. Strong be the spirit which dwells in the breast of you. Never may folly or shame get the best of you. You shall be tempted in fancied security, but make no choice that is stained with impurity. Boy of mine, boy of mine, time shall command of you, thought from the brain of you, work from the hand of you. Voices of pleasure shall whisper and call to you, luring you far from the hard tasks that fall to you. Then, as you're meeting life's bitterest test of men, God grant you strength to be true as the best of men. Boy of mine, boy of mine, sing in your way along, cling to your laughter and cheerfully play along. Kind to your neighbor be, offer your hand to him, you shall grow great as your heart shall expand to him. But when, for victory sweet, you're fighting there, Know that your record of life you are writing there. Boy of mine, boy of mine, this is my prayer for you. Never may shame pen one line of despair for you. Never may conquest or glory mean all to you. Cling to your honor, whatever shall fall to you. 
rather than victory, rather than fame to you, choose to be true and let nothing bring shame to you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Little Girl by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Krista Zaleski O oh, little girl with eyes of brown And smiles that fairly light the town, I wonder if you really know Just why it is we love you so, And why with all the little girls With shining eyes and tangled curls That throng and dance this big world through, Our hearts have room for only you. Since other little girls are gay and laugh and sing and romp and play, and all are beautiful to see, why should you mean so much to me? And why should mother, day and night, make you her source of all delight, and always find in your caress her greatest sum of happiness? Oh, there's a reason good for this, you laughing little bright-eyed miss, in this town with all its girls, with shining eyes and sun-kissed curls, if we should search it through and through, we'd find not one so fair as you, and none, however fair of face, within our hearts could take your place. For one glad day not long ago God sent you down to us below, and said that you were ours to keep, to guard awake and watch asleep. And ever since the day you came, no other child has seemed the same, no other smiles are quite so fair as those which happily you wear. We seem to live from day to day to hear the things you have to say, and just because God gave us you, we prize the little things you do. Though God has filled this world with flowers, we like you best because you're ours. In you our greatest joys we know, and this is why we love you so. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Fellow's Hat by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by D. L. Brown It's funny about a fellow's hat. He can't remember where it's at, or where he took it off, or when, the time he's wanting it again. He knows just where he leaves his shoes, his sweater he won't often lose, and he can find his rubbers, but he can't tell where his hat is put. A fellow's hat gets anywhere. Sometimes he'll find it in a chair, or on the sideboard, or maybe it's in the kitchen, just where he gave it a toss beside the sink, when he came in to get a drink, and then forgot, but anyhow, he never knows where it is now. A fellow's hat is never where he thinks it is when he goes there. It's never any use to look for it upon a closet hook, because it is always in some place it shouldn't be, to his disgrace, and he will find it like as not behind some radiator hot. A fellow's hat can get away from him most any time of day, so he can't ever find it when he wants it to go out again. It hides in corners, dark and grim, and seems to want to bother him. It disappears from sight somehow. I wish I knew where mine is now. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Good Little Boy by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Winifred Asman Once there was a boy who never Tore his clothes or hardly ever Never made his sister mad Never whipped for being bad Never scolded by his ma Never frowned at by his pa Always fit for folks to see Always good as good could be This good little boy from heaven So I'm told was only seven Yet he never shed real tears when his mother scrubbed his ears. And at times when he was dressed for a party in his best, he was careful of his shirt not to get it smeared with dirt. Used to study late at night, learning how to read and write. When he played a baseball game, right away he always came when his mother called him in and he never made a din, but was quiet as a mouse when they'd company in the house. Liked to wash his hands and face, liked to work around the place, never, when he tired of play, left his wagon in the way, or his bat and ball around, put him where they could be found. And that good boy married Ma, and today he is my Pa. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Green Apple Time by Edward A. Guest, read for LibriVox by Doty. Green apple time, and oh, the joy, once more to be a healthy boy. 
casting a long and greedy eye at every tree he passes by, risking the direst consequence to sneak inside a neighbor's fence and shake from many a loaded limb the fruit that seemed so near to him. Gosh, but once more I'd like to be the boy I was in 83. Here I am, sitting with my pipe, waiting for apples to get ripe, waiting until the friendly sun has bronzed them all and says they're done, not daring any more to climb and pick a few a further time, no legs to run, no teeth to chew, the way that healthy youngsters do, just old enough to sit and wait and pick my apple from a plate. Plate apples ain't to be compared with those you've ventured for and dared. It's winning them from branches high, or nipping them when no one's by, or finding them the time you feel you really need another meal, or coming unexpectedly upon a farmer's loaded tree and grabbing all that you can eat that goes to make an apple sweet. Green apple time, go to it, boy, and cram yourself right full of joy. Watch for the farmer's dog and run. There'll come a time it can't be done. There'll come a day you can't digest the fruit you've stuffed into your vest. Nor climb, but you'll sit down like me and watch him ripen and on the tree. And just like me, you'll have to wait to pick your apples from a plate. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. She Mothered Five by Edgar A. Guest Recorded for LibriVox.org by Krista Zaleski. She mothered five. Night after night she watched a little bed. Night after night she cooled a fevered head. Day after day she guarded little feet, taught little minds the dangers of the street, taught little lips to utter simple prayers, whispered of strength that some day would be theirs, and trained them all to use it as they should. She gave her babies to the nation's good. She mothered five. She gave her beauty from her cheeks let fade, the rose-blush beauty to her mother trade. She saw the wrinkles furrowing her brow, yet smiling said, My boy grows stronger now. When pleasures called, she turned away and said, I dare not leave my babies to be fed by strangers' hands. Besides, they are too small. I must be near to hear them when they call. She mothered five. Night after night they sat about her knee, and heard her tell of what some day would be. From her they learned that in the world outside are cruelty and vice and selfishness and pride. From her they learned the wrongs they ought to shun, what things to love, what work must still be done. She led them through the labyrinth of youth, and brought five men and women up to truth. She mothered five. Her name may be unknown save to a few. Of her the outside world but little knew. But somewhere five are treading virtue's ways, serving the world and brightening its days. Somewhere are five who tempted stand upright, who cling to honor, keep her memory bright. Somewhere this mother toils and is alive, no more as one, but in the breasts of five. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Little Girls Are Best by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Krista Zaleski Little Girls Are Best Little girls are mighty nice. Take them any way they come. They are always worth their price. Life without them would be glum. Run earth's lists of treasures through. Pile them high until they fall. Gold and costly jewels, too. Little girls are best of all. Nothing equals them on earth. I'm an old man, and I know. Any little girl is worth more than all the gold below. Eyes are blue or brown or gray, raven hair or golden curls. There's no joy on earth today quite so fine as little girls. Pudgy nose or freckled face, fairy-like or plain to see. God has surely blessed the place where a little girl may be. There the jewels of his crown dropped to earth from heaven above like we angel souls sent down to remind us of his love. God has made some lovely things, roses red and skies of blue, trees and babbling silver springs, gardens glistening with dew. But take every gift to man, 
big and little, great and small, judge it on its merits, and little girls are best of all. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The World and Bud by Edgar A. Guest Read by Kathy K. If we were all alike, what a dreadful world t'would be! No one would know which one was you, or which of us was me. We'd never have a skinny, or a freckles, or a fat. And there wouldn't be a sissy boy to wear a velvet hat. And we'd all of us be pitchers when we played a baseball match. For we'd never have a feller who'd have nerve enough to catch. If we were all alike and looked and thought the same, I wonder how they'd call us, cause there'd only be one name. And there'd only be one flavor for our ice cream sodas, too. And one color for a necktie, and I suppose that would be blue. And maybe we'd have mothers who were very fond of curls. And they make us fellers wear our hair like lovely little girls. Sometimes I think it's funny when I hear some feller say that he isn't fond of chocolate when I eat it every day. Or some other fellow doesn't like the books I like to read. But I'm glad that we are different. Yes, siree, I am indeed. If everybody looked alike and talked alike, oh, gee, we'd never know which one was you or which of us was me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Aw, gee whiz, by Edgar A. Guest, read for LibriVox.org, by Krista Zaleski. Queerest little chap he is, always saying, Aw, gee whiz, needing something from the store that you've got to send him for, and you call him from his play, then it is you hear him say, Aw, gee whiz. Seems that most expressive phrase is a part of childhood days. Call him in at supper time, hands and face all smeared with grime. Send him up to wash, and he answers you disgustedly. Ah, gee whiz! When it's time to go to bed, and he'd rather play instead. As you call him from the street, he comes in with dragging feet, knowing that he has to go. Then it is, he mutters low, Ah, gee whiz! Makes no difference what you ask of him as a little task. He has yet to learn that life crosses many a joy with strife. So when duty mars his play, always we can hear him say, Aw, gee whiz! End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Practicing Time by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Krista Zaleski Always whenever I want to play, I've got to practice an hour a day. Get through breakfast and make my bed. And Mother says, Marjorie, run ahead. There's a time for work and a time for fun. So go and get your practicing done. And Bud, he chuckles and says to me, Yes, do your practicing, Marjorie. A brother's an awful tease, you know. And he just says that because I hate it so. They leave me alone in the parlor there to play the scales or the maiden's prayer. And if I stop, mother's bound to call. Marjorie, dear, you're not playing at all. Don't waste your time, but keep right on, or you'll have to stay when the hour is gone. Or maybe the maid looks in at me and says, you're not playing, as I can see. Just hustle along. I've got work to do. I can't dust the room until you get through. Then when I've run over the scales and things, like the fairies dance or the mountain springs, and my fingers ache and my head is sore, I find I must sit there a half hour more. An hour is terribly long, I say, when you've got to practice and want to play. So slowly at times has the big hand dropped that I was sure that the clock had stopped. But Mother called down to me, Don't forget, a full hour, please, it's not over yet. Oh, when I get big and have children too, there's one thing that I will never do. I won't have brothers to tease the girls and make them mad when they pull their curls and laugh at them when they've got to stay and practice their music an hour a day. I won't have a maid like the one we've got that likes to boss you around a lot. And I won't have a clock that can go so slow when it's practice time, because I hate it so. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
The Christmas Gift for Mother by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Krista Zaleski The Christmas Gift for Mother In the Christmas times of the long ago, there was one event we used to know that was better than any other. It wasn't the toys that we hoped to get, but the talks we had, and I hear them yet, of the gift we'd buy for mother. If ever love fashioned a Christmas gift, or saved its money and practiced thrift, was done in those days, my brother, those golden times of long gone by, of our happiest years when you and I talked over the gift for mother. We hadn't gone forth on our different ways, nor coined our lives into yesterdays, in the fires that smelt and smother, and we whispered and planned in our youthful glee of that marvellous something which was to be the gift of our hearts to mother. It had to be all that our purse could give, something she'd treasure while she could live, and better than any other. We gave it the best of our love and thought, and oh, the joy when at last we'd bought the marvellous gift for mother. Now I think as we go on our different ways of the joy of those vanished yesterdays, how good it would be, my brother, if this Christmas time we could only know the same sweet thrill of long ago when we shared in the gift for mother. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Bedtime by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Laurel Monroe It's bedtime, and we lock the door. Put out the lights, the day is o'er. All that can come of good or ill, the record of this day to fill is written down the worry cease, and old and young may rest in peace. We knew not when we started out what dangers hedged us all about, what little pleasures we should gain, what should be ours to bear of pain. But now the fires are burning low, and this day's history we know. No harm has come, the laughter here has been unbroken by a tear. We've met no hurt, too great to bear. We have not had to bow to care. The children, all are safe in bed. There's nothing now for us to dread. When bedtime comes and we can say that we have safely lived the day, how sweet the calm that settles down and shuts away the noisy town. There is no danger now to fear until tomorrow shall appear. When the long bedtime comes, and I, in sleep eternal come to lie, when life has nothing more in store, and silently I close the door, God grant my weary soul may claim security from hurt and shame. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Willing Horse by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by James N. I'd rather be the willing horse that people ride to death than be the proud and haughty steed that children dare not touch. I'd rather haul a merry pack and finish out of breath than never leave the barn to toil because I'm worth too much. So boast your noble pedigrees, and talk of manners if you please. The weary horse enjoys his ease when all his work is done. The willing horse, day and out, can hear the merry children shout, and every time they are about, he shares in all their fun. I want no guards beside my door to pick and choose my friends for me. I would not be shut off from men as is the fancy steed. I do not care when I go by that no one turns his eyes to see the dashing manner of my gait, which marks my noble breed. I am content to trudge the road and willingly to draw my load, sometimes to know the spur and goad when I begin to lag. I'd rather feel the collar jerk and tug at me the while I work than all the tasks of life to shirk as does the stylish nag. So let me be the willing horse 
that now and then is overtasked. Let me be one the children love and freely dare to ride. I'd rather be the gentle steed of which too much is sometimes asked than be the one that never knows the youngsters at his side. So drive me wheresoever you will, on level road or up the hill. Pile on my back the burden still, and run me out of breath, and love and friendship day by day, and kindly words I'll take my pay. A willing horse, that is the way I choose to meet my death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Where Children Play by Edgar A. Guest, read for LibriVox.org by Rachel Bishop. On every street there's a certain place where the children gather to romp and race. There's a certain house where they meet in throngs to play their games and to sing their songs. And they trample the lawn with their busy feet, and they scatter their playthings about the streets. But though some folks order them off, I say, let the house be mine where the children play. Armies gather about the door and fill the air with their battle roar. Cowboys swinging their lariat loops dash around the house with the wildest whoops. And old folks have to look out when they are holding an Indian tribe at bay, for danger may find them on flying feet who pass by the house where the children meet. There are lawns too lovely to bear the weight of a troop of boys when they roller skate. There are porches fine that must never know the stamping of footsteps that come and go. But on every street there's a favorite place where the children gather to romp and race, and I'm glad in my heart that it's mine to say, ours is the house where the children play. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. How Do You Buy Your Money? By Edgar A. Guest. Read for LibriVox.org. By James N. How do you buy your money? For money is bought and sold. And each man barters himself on earth for his silver and shining gold. And by the bargain he makes with men, the sum of his life is told. Some buy their coins in a manly way. Some buy them with honest toil. Some pay for their currency here on earth by tilling a patch of soil. Some buy it with copper and iron and steel, and some with barrels of oil. The good man buys it from day to day by giving the best he can. He coins his strength for his children's needs and lives to a simple plan. And he keeps some time for the home he makes and some for his fellow man. But some men buy it with women's tears and some with a blasted name. And some will barter the joy of life for the fortune they hope to claim. And some are so mad for the clink of gold that they buy it with deeds of shame. How do you buy your money? For money demands its price. And some men think when they purchase coin that they mustn't be over nice. But beware of the man who would sell you gold at a shameful sacrifice. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mother's Day by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Krista Zaleski Let every day be Mother's Day. Make roses grow along her way, and beauty everywhere. Oh, never let her eyes be wet with tears of sorrow or regret, and never cease to care. Come, grown-up children, and rejoice that you can hear your mother's voice. A day for her, for you she gave, long years of love and service brave. For you her youth was spent, there was no weight of hurt or care. Too heavy for her strength to bear, she followed where you went. Her courage and her love sublime you could depend on all the time. No day or night she set apart on which to open wide her heart, and welcome you within, there was no hour you would not be first in her thought and memory, though you were black as sin. Though skies were gray or skies were blue, not once has she forgotten you. Let every day be Mother's Day, with love and roses strew her way, and smiles of joy and pride. Come, grown-up children, to the knee, where long ago you used to be, and never turn aside. Oh, never let her eyes grow wet, with tears because her babes forget. 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. When We Play the Fool by Edgar A. Guest, read for LibriVox.org by Dodie. Last night I stood in a tawdry place and watched the ways of the human race. I looked at a party of shrieking girls piled on a table that whirls and whirls and saw them thrown in a tangled heap sprawling and squirming and several deep and unto the wife who was standing by these are all angels to be said i i followed the ways of the merry throng and heard the laughter and mirth and song into a barrel which turned and swayed men and women a journey made and tumbling together they seemed to be like so many porpoises out at sea men and women who'd worked all day eagerly seeking a chance to play. "'What do you make of it all?' she said. I answered, "'The dead are a long time dead, and care is bitter and duty stern, and each must weep when it comes his turn, and all grow weary and long for play, so here is laughter to end the day.' "'Foolish? Oh, yes, it is that,' said I. "'But better the laugh than the dreary sigh. Now look at us here, for we're like them, too.' and many the foolish things we do. We often grow silly and seek a smile in a thousand ways that are not worth while, yet after the mirth and the jest are through, we shall all be judged by the deeds we do, and God shall forget on the judgment day the fools we were in our hours of play. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. What Makes an Artist by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org We got to talking art one day, Discussing in a general way How some can match with brush And paint the glory of a tree, And some in stone can catch the things Of which the dreamy poet sings while others seem to have no way to tell the joys they see. Old Blake had sat in silence there, and let each one of us declare our notions of what's known as art, until he'd heard us through. And then said he, It seems to me that any man, whoe'er he be, becomes an artist by the good he daily tries to do. He need not write the books men read to be an artist. No, indeed. He need not work with paint and brush to show his love of art. Who does a kindly deed today and helps another on his way? Has painted beauty on a face and played the poet's part. Though some of us cannot express our inmost thoughts of loveliness, we prove we love the beautiful by how we act and live. The poet singing of a tree, no greater poet is than he, who finds it in his heart some care unto a tree to give. Though he who works in marble stone The name of artist here may own, No less an artist is the man Who guards his children well. Tis art to love the fine and true. By what we are and what we do, How much we love life's nobler things To all the world we tell. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. She Powders Her Nose by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org A woman is queer. There's no doubt about that. She hates to be thin, and she hates to be fat. One minute it's laughter, the next it's a cry. 
You can't understand her, however you try. But there's one thing about her which everyone knows. A woman's not dressed till she powders her nose. You never can tell what a woman will say. She's a law to herself every hour of the day. It keeps a man guessing to know what to do. And mostly he's wrong when his guessing is through. But this you can bet on. Wherever she goes, she'll find some occasion to powder her nose. I've studied the sex for a number of years. I've watched her in laughter and seen her in tears. On her ways and her whims I have pondered a lot. To find what will please her and just what will not. But all that I've learned from the start to the close is that sooner or later she'll powder her nose. At church or a ball game, a dance or a show, there's one thing about her I know that I know. At weddings or funerals, dinners of taste, you can bet that her hand will dive into her waist. And every few minutes, she'll strike up a pose. And the whole world must wait till she powders her nose. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Chip on Your Shoulder by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone You'll learn when you're older that chip on your shoulder which you dare other boys to upset and stand up and fight for and struggle and smite for has caused you much shame and regret. When time, life's adviser, has made you much wiser, you won't be so quick with the blow. You won't be so willing to fight for a shilling and change a good friend to a foe. You won't be a sticker for trifles and bicker and quarrel for nothing at all. You'll grow to be kinder, more thoughtful and blinder to faults which are petty and small. You won't take the trouble, your two fists to double, when someone your pride may offend. When with rage now you bristle, you'll smile or you'll whistle, and keep the good will of a friend. You'll learn when you're older, that chip on your shoulder, which proudly you battle to guard, has frequently shamed you, and often defamed you, and left you a record that's marred. When you've grown calm and steady, you won't be so ready to fight for a difference that's small. For you'll know, when you're older, that chip on your shoulder is only a chip after all. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. All for the Best by Edgar A. Guest. Read for LibriVox.org by Laurel Munro. Things mostly happen for the best, however hard it seems today, when some fond plan has gone astray, or what you've wished for most is lost. And you sit counting up the cost, with eyes half blind by tears of grief, while doubt is choking out belief. You'll find when all is understood that what seemed bad was really good. Life can't be counted in a day. The present rain that will not stop next autumn means a bumper crop. We wonder why some things must be. Care's purpose we can seldom see. And yet long afterwards we turn to view the past and then we learn that what once filled our minds with doubt was good for us as it worked out. I've never known an hour of care, but that I've later come to see 
that it has brought some joy to me, even the sorrows I have borne, leaving me lonely and forlorn, and hurt and bruised and sick at heart, in life's great plan have had a part. And though I could not understand why I should bow to death's command, as time went on I came to know that it was really better so. Things mostly happen for the best. So narrow is our vision here that we are blinded by a tear and stunned by every hurt and blow which comes today to strike us low. And yet, some day we turn and find that what seemed cruel once was kind. Most things I hold are wisely planned if we could only understand. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Kick Under the Table by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone After a man has been married a while, and his wife has grown used to his manner and style, when she knows from the twinkle that lights up his eye the thoughts that he's thinking, the wherefore and why, and just what he'll say, and just what he'll do, and he's sure that he'll make a bad break ere he's through. She has one little trick that she'll work when she's able. She takes a sly kick at him under the table. He may fancy the story he's telling is true, or he's doing the thing which is proper to do. He may fancy he's holding his own with the rest, the life of the party, and right at his best when quickly he learns to his utter dismay that he mustn't say what he's just started to say. He is stopped at the place where he hoped to begin by his wife, who has taken a kick at his shin. If he picks the wrong fork for the salad, he knows that fact by the feel of his wife's slippered toes. If he started a bit of untellable news on the calf of his leg, there is planted a bruise. Oh, I wonder sometimes what would happen to me if the wife were not seated just where she could be, on guard every minute to watch every trick, and keep me in line all the time with her kick. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Leader of the Gang by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Seems only just a year ago that he was toddling round the place in pretty little coloured suits and with a pink and shiny face. I used to hold him in my arms to watch when our canary sang and now tonight he tells me that he's leader of his gang. It seems but yesterday, I vow, that I with fear was almost dumb, living those dreadful hours of care, waiting the time for him to come. And I can still recall the thrill of that first cry of his which rang within our walls. And now that babe tells me he's leader of his gang. Gone from our lives are all the joys which yesterday we used to own. The baby that we thought we had out of the little home has flown, and in his place another stands, whose garments in disorder hang, a lad who now with pride proclaims that he's the leader of his gang. And yet somehow I do not grieve for what it seems we may have lost. To have so strong a boy as this, most cheerfully I pay the cost. I find myself a sense of joy to comfort every little pang, and pray that they shall find in him a worthy leader of the gang. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ma 
and the Ouija Board by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Carrie Adams Your Book Voice I don't know what it's all about, but Ma says that she wants to know if spirits in the other world can really talk to us below. And Pa says, Gosh, there's folks enough on earth to talk to, I should think without you pestering the folks whose souls have gone across the brink. But Ma, she wants to find out things and study on her own accord. And so a month or two ago, she went and bought a Ouija board. It's just a shiny piece of wood with letters printed here and there, and has a little table which you put your fingers on with care. And then you sit and whisper low some question that you want to know. Then by and by the spirit comes and makes the little table go. And Ma, she starts to giggle then, and Pa just grumbles out, Oh, Lord, I wish you hadn't bought this thing. We didn't need a Ouija board. You're moving it, says Ma to Pa. I am not, says Pa. I know it's you. You're making it spell things to us that you know very well aren't true. That isn't so, says Ma to him, but I'm certain from the way the Ouija moves that you're the one who's telling it just what to say. It's just electricity, says Pa, like batteries all men are stored. But anyhow, I don't believe we ought to have a Ouija board. One night, Ma got it out and said, Now, Pa, I want you to be fair. Just keep right still and let your hands rest lightly on the table there. Oh, Ouija, tell me, tell me true. Are we to buy another car, and will we get it very soon? She asked. Oh, tell us from afar. Don't buy a car. The letter spelled, The price this year you can't afford. And Ma got mad, and since that time she's never used the Ouija board. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Call of the Woods by Edgar A. Guest. Read for LibriVox.org by Rachel Bishop. I must get out to the woods again, to the whispering trees and the birds a-wing, away from the haunts of pale-faced men to the spaces wide where strength is king. I must get out where the skies are blue and the air is clean and the rest is sweet, out where there's never a task to do or a goal to reach or a foe to meet. I must get out on the trails once more that wind through shadowy haunts and cool, away from the presence of wall and door and see myself in a crystal pool. I must get out where the silent things, where neither laughter nor hate is heard, where malice never the humblest stings, and no one is hurt by a spoken word. Oh, I've heard the call of the tall white pine, and heard the call of the running brook. I'm tired of the tasks which each day are mine, I'm weary of reading a printed book. I want to get out of the din and strife, the clang and clamor of turning wheel, and walk for a day where life is life, and the joys are true, and the pictures real. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Committee Meetings by Edgar A. Guest, read for LibriVox.org by Molly Murphy. For this and that and various things, it seems that men must get together, to purchase cups or diamond rings, or to discuss the price of leather. From nine to ten or two to three, or any hour that's fast and fleeting, there is a constant call for me to go to some committee meeting. The church has serious work to do. The lodge and club has need of workers. They ask for just an hour or two. Surely I will not join the shirkers. Though I have duties of my own, I should not drop before completing. There comes the call by telephone to go to some committee meeting. No longer may I eat my lunch in quietude and contemplation. I must foregather with the bunch to raise a fund to save the nation. And I must talk of plans and schemes, the while a scanty bite I'm eating, until I vow today, it seems, my life is one committee meeting. When over me the night shall fall and my poor soul goes upwards winging, 
unto that heavenly realm where all is bright with joy and gay with singing. I hope to hear St. Peter say, and I shall thank him for the greeting. Come in and rest from day to day. Here there is no committee meeting. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pa and the Monthly Bills by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone When Ma gets out the monthly bills and sets them all in front of Dad, she makes us children run away because she knows he may get mad. And then she smiles a bit and says, I hope you will not fuss and fret. There's nothing here except the things I absolutely had to get. And Pa, he looks em over first. The things you had to have, says he. I suppose that we'd have died without that twenty-dollar lingerie. Then he starts in to write the checks for laundry and for light and gas, and never says a word about them, because they're small he lets them pass. But when he starts to grunt and groan, and stops the while his pipe he fills, we knows that he is getting down to where Ma's hid the bigger bills. Just what we had to have, says he, and I'm supposed to pay the tolls. Nine dollars and a half for, say, what the deuce are camisoles? If you should break a leg, says Pa, and couldn't get downtown to shop, I'll bet the dry goods men would see their business take an awful drop. And if they missed you for a week, they'd have to fire a dozen clerks. Say, couldn't we have got along without this bunch of Billy Burks? But Ma just sits and grins at him, and never has a word to say. Because, she says, Pa likes to fuss about the bills he has to pay. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Bob White by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Out near the links where I go to play my favourite game from day to day, there's a friend of mine that I've never met, walked with, or broken bread with, yet I've talked to him oft, and he's talked to me, whenever I've been where he's chanced to be. He's a cheery old chap, who keeps out of sight, a gay little fellow whose name is Bob White. Bob White? Bob White? I can hear him call as I follow the trail to my little ball. Bob White? Bob White? With a note of cheer that was just designed for a mortal ear. Then I drift off from the world of men, and I send an answer right back to him then, and we whistle away to each other there, glad of the life which is ours to share. Bob White? Bob White? May you live to be the head of a numerous family. May you boldly call to your friends out here, with never an enemy's gun to fear. I am a better man as I pass along for your cheery call and your bit of song. May your food be plenty and skies be bright to the end of your days, good friend Bob White. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When Ma Wants Something New by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Winifred Asman Last night Ma said to Pa, My dear, the Williamsons are coming here to visit for a week or two, and I must have a talk with you. We need some things which we must get. You promised me a dinner set, and I should like it while they're here. And Pa looked up and said, My dear, a dinner set? Well, I guess not. What's happened to the one we've got? We need a parlor rug, says Ma. We've got a parlor rug, says Pa. We ought to have another chair. You're sitting in a good one there. The parlor curtains are a fright. When these are washed, they look all right. The old stuff's pitiful to see. It still looks mighty good to me. The sofa's worn beyond repair. It doesn't look so bad, I swear. 
Gee whiz, you make me tired, says Ma. Why, what's the matter now, says Pa? You come and go and never see how old our stuff has grown to be. It still looks just the same to you as what it did when it was new. And every time you think it's strange that I should like to have a change. I'm getting old, says Pa. Maybe you'd like a younger man than me. If this old rug was worn and thin, at night you'd still come walking in and throw your hat upon a chair and never see a single tear. So long as any chair could stand and bear your weight, you'd think it grand. If home depended all on you, it never would get something new. All right, says Pa. Go buy the stuff. But say, am I still good enough? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sittin' on the Porch by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Krista Zaleski Sittin' on the porch at night when all the tasks are done Just restin' there and talkin' with my easy slippers on And my shirt band thrown wide open and my feet upon the rail Oh, it's then I'm at my richest with a wealth that cannot fail For the scent of early roses seems to flood the evening air and a throne of downright gladness is my wicker rocking chair. The dog asleep beside me, and the children romping round, with their shrieks of merry laughter, oh, there is no gladder sound, to the ears of weary mortals, spite of all the scoffers say, or a grander bit of music than the children at their play. And I tell myself times over when I'm sitting there at night that the world in which I'm living is a place of real delight. Then the moon begins its climbing, and the stars shine overhead, and the mother calls the children, and she takes them up to bed. And I smoke my pipe in silence, and I think of many things, and balance up my riches with the lonesomeness of kings. And I come to this conclusion, and I'll wager that I'm right, that I'm happier than they are, sitting on my porch at night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. With Dog and Gun by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Out in the woods with a dog and gun Is my idea of a real day's fun Taint the birds that I'm out to kill That furnish me with the finest thrill Cause I never worry or fret a lot Or curse my luck if I miss a shot There's many a time, and I don't know why I shoot too low or I aim too high, and all I can see is the distant whirr of a bird that's getting back home to her. Yep, getting back home at the end of day, and I'm just as glad that he got away. There's a whole lot more in the woods of fall than the birds you bag, if you think at all. There's colours of gold and red and brown as never were known in the busy town. There's room to breathe in the purest air, And something worth looking at everywhere. There's the dog who's leading you on and on To a patch of cover where birds have gone, And standing there without move or change Till you give the sign that you've got the range. That's thrill enough for my blood, I say, So why should I care if they get away? Fact is, there are times that I'd rather miss Than to bring em down, cause I feel like this. There's a heap more joy in a living thing Than a breast crushed in or a broken wing. And I can't feel right, and I never will, When I look at a bird that I've dared to kill. And I'm just plumb happy to tramp about, And follow my dog as he hunts em out, Just watching him point in his silent way, where the bobwhites are in the partridge stay. For the joy of the great outdoors I've had, so why should I care if my aim is bad? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode Mr. Laughter by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by James N. Old Mr. Laughter comes a grinning down the way, singing 
never mind your troubles, for they'll surely pass away. Singing, now the sun is shining, and there's roses everywhere. Tomorrow will be soon enough to fret about your care. Old Mr. Laughter comes a grinning at my door. Singing, don't go after money when you've got enough and more. Singing, laugh with me this morning and be happy while you may. What's the use of riches if they never let you play? Old Mr. Laughter comes a grinning all the time. Singing happy songs of gladness and a good old fashioned rhyme. Singing, keep the smiles a going till they write your epitaph. And don't let fame or fortune ever steal away your laugh. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Family Row by Edgar A. Guest. Read for LibriVox.org by Molly Murphy. I freely confess there are good friends of mine with whom we are often invited to dine who get on my nerves so that I cannot eat or stay with my usual ease in my seat. For I know that if something should chance to occur, which he may not like, or which doesn't please her, that we'll have to try to be pleasant somehow, while they stage a fine little family row. Now a family row is a private affair, and guests, I am certain, should never be there. I have freely maintained that a man and his wife cannot always agree on their journey through life. But they ought not to bicker and wrangle and shout and show off their rage when their friends are about. It takes all the joy from a party, I vow, when some couple starts up a family row. It's a difficult job to stay cool and polite when your host and your hostess are staging a fight. It's hard to talk sweet to a dame with a frown or smile at a man that you want to knock down. You sit like a dummy and look far away but you just can't help hearing the harsh things they say. It ruins the dinner, I'm telling you now, when your host and your hostess get mixed in a row. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lucky Man by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Carrie Adams Luck had a favor to bestow, and wondered where to let it go. No lazy man on earth, said she, shall get this happy gift from me. I will not pass it to the man, who will not do the best he can. I will not make this splendid gift to one who has not practiced thrift. It shall not benefit deceit, nor help the man who's played the cheat. He that has failed to fight with pluck shall never know the goddess luck. I'll look around a bit to see what man has earned some help from me. She found a man whose hands were soiled because from day to day he'd toiled. He'd dreamed by night and worked by day to make life's contest go his way. He'd kept his post and daily slaved, and something of his wage he'd saved. He'd clutched at every circumstance which might have been his golden chance. The goddess smiled, and then, kerslap, she dropped her favor in his lap. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lonely by Edgar A. Guest. Read for LibriVox.org by Rachel Bishop. They're all away, and the house is still, and the dust lies thick on the window sill, and the stairway creaks in a solemn tone, this taunting phrase, you are all alone. They've gone away, and the rooms are bare, I miss his cap from a parlor chair, and I miss the toys in the lonely hall, but most of any, I miss his call. I miss the shouts and the laughter gay which greeted me at the close of day, and there isn't a thing in the house we own but sobbingly says you are all alone. It is only a house that is mine to know, an empty house that is cold with woe, like a prison grim with its bars of black, and it won't be home till they all come back. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Cookie Jar by Edgar A. Guest 
Recorded for LibriVox.org by Krista Zaleski. You can rig up a house with all manner of things, the prayer rugs of sultans and princes and kings. You can hang on its walls the old tapestries rare, which some dead Egyptian once treasured with care. But though costly and gorgeous its furnishings are, it must have to be homelike an old cookie jar. There are just a few things that a home must possess, besides all your money and all your success. A few good old books which some loved one has read, some trinkets of those whose sweet spirits have fled. And then in the pantry, not shoved back too far, for the hungry to get to, that old cookie jar. Let the house be a mansion I care not at all. Let the finest of pictures be hung on each wall. Let the carpets be made of the richest velour, and the chairs only those which great wealth can procure. I'd still want to keep for the joy of my flock that homey old-fashioned well-filled cookie crock. Like the love of the mother it shines through our years, it has soothed all our hurts and has dried away tears. It has paid us for toiling in sorrow or joy. It has always shown kindness to each girl and boy. And I'm sorry for people, whoever they are, who live in a house where there's no cookie jar. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Little Wrangles by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Doty Lord, we've had our little wrangles and we've had our little bouts. There's many a time, I reckon, that we have been on the outs. My tongue's a trifle hasty and my temper's apt to fly. And Mother, let me tell you, has a sting in her reply. But I couldn't live without her, and it's plain as plain can be, that in fair or sunny weather Mother needs a man like me. I've banged the door and muttered angry words beneath my breath. For at times when she was scolding, mothers plagued me most to death. But we've always laughed it over when we both cooled down a bit, and we never had a difference, but a smile would settle it. And if such a thing could happen, we could share life's joys and tears and live right on together for another thousand years. Some men give up too easy in the game of married life. They haven't got the courage to be worthy of a wife. And I've seen a lot of women that have made their lives a mess because they couldn't bear the burdens that are mixed with happiness. So long as folks are human, they'll have many faults that jar. And the way to live with people is to take them as they are. We've been 40 years together, good and bad and rain and shine. I've forgotten mother's faults now, and she never mentions mine. In the days when sorrow struck us and we shared a common woe, we just leaned upon each other and her weakness didn't show. And I learned how much I need her and how tender she can be. And through it, maybe, mother saw the better side of me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wide Outdoors by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Molly Murphy The rich may pay for orchids rare, But, oh, the apple tree flings out its blossoms to the world for every eye to see. And all who sigh for loveliness may walk beneath the sky And claim a richer beauty than man's gold can ever buy. The blooming cherry trees are free for all to look upon, The dogwood buds for all of us, and not some favorite one. The wide outdoors is no man's own. The stranger on the street can cast his eyes on many a rose and claim its fragrance sweet. Small gardens are shut in by walls, but none can wall the sky, and none can hide the friendly trees from all who travel by. And none can hold the apple boughs and claim them for his own, for all the beauties of the earth belong to God alone. So let me walk the world just now and wander far and near. Earth's loveliness is mine to see, its music mine to hear. There's not a single apple bough that spills its blooms about, but I can claim the joy of it, and none can shut me out. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Where's Mama? by Edgar A. Guest. Read for LibriVox.org by Krista Zaleski. 
comes flying in from the street. Where's Mama? Friend or stranger, thus he'll greet. Where's Mama? Doesn't want to say hello. Home from school or play he'll go. Straight to what he wants to know. Where's Mama? Many times a day he'll shout, Where's Mama? Seems afraid that she's gone out. Where's Mama? Is his first thought at the door. She's the one he's looking for. And he questions o'er and o'er, Where's Mama? Can't be happy till he knows, Where's Mama? So he begs us to disclose, Where's Mama? And it often seems to me, as I hear his anxious plea, that no sweeter phrase can be, Where's Mama? Like to hear it day by day, Where's Mama? Loveliest phrase that lips can say, Where's Mama? And I pray as time shall flow, and the long years come and go, that he'll always want to know, Where's Mama? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Summer Dreams by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Krista Zaleski Drowsy old summer with nothing to do. I'd like to be drowsing and dreaming with you. I'd like to stretch out in the shade of a tree and fancy the white clouds were ships out at sea or castles with turrets and treasures and things and peopled with princesses, fairies, and kings and just drench my soul with the glorious joy, which was mine to possess as a barefooted boy. Drowsy old summer, your skies are as blue as the skies which a dreamy-eyed youngster once knew, and I fancy today all the pictures are there, the ships and the pirates and princesses fair, the red scenes of battle, the gay cheering throngs, which greeted the hero who righted all wrongs. But somehow or other these old eyes of mine can't see what they did as a youngster of nine. Drowsy old summer, I'd like to forget some things which I've learned and some hurts I have met. I'd like the old visions of splendor and joy, which were mine to possess as a barefooted boy, when I dreamed of the glorious deeds I would do as soon as I'd galloped my brief boyhood through. I'd like to come back and look into your skies with that wondrous belief in those far-seeing eyes. Drowsy old summer, my dream days have gone. Only things which are real I must now look upon. No longer I see in the skies overhead the pictures that were, for the last one has fled. I have learned that not all of our dreams can come true, that the toilers are many and heroes are few. But I'd like once again to look up there and see the man that I fancied some day I might be. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I Ain't Dead Yet by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Time was I used to worry, and I'd sit around and sigh, and think with every ache I got that I was gonna die. I'd see disaster coming from a dozen different ways, and prophesy calamity, and dark and dreary days. But I've come to this conclusion, that it's foolishness to fret. I've had my share of sickness, but I ain't dead yet. Wet springs have come to grieve me, and I've grumbled at the showers, but I can't recall a June time that forgot to bring the flowers. I've had my business troubles, and look failure in the face. But the crashes I expected seem to pass right by the place. So I'm taking life more calmly, pleased with everything I get, and not over hurt by losses, cause I ain't dead yet. I've feared a thousand failures, and a thousand deaths I've died. I've had this world in ruins by the gloom I've prophesied. But the sun shines out this morning, and the skies above are blue, and with all my griefs and troubles, I have somehow lived them through. There may be cares before me, much like those that I have met. Death will come some day and take me, but I ain't dead yet. End of poem. 
This recording is in the public domain. The Cure for Weariness by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra The Cure for Weariness Seemed like I couldn't stand it any more. The factory whistles blowing day by day, and men and children hurrying by the door, and street cars clanging on their busy way. The faces of the people seemed to be washed pale by tears of grief and strife and care, till everywhere I turned to I could see the same old gloomy pictures of despair. The windows of the shops all looked the same, decked out with stuff their owners wished to sell. When visitors across our doorway came, I could recite the tales they'd have to tell. All things had lost their old-time power to please. Dog-tired I was, and irritable too and so I traded chimney-tops for trees, and shingled roof for open skies of blue. I dropped my tools, and took my rod and line and tackle-box, and left the busy town. I found a favorite resting spot of mine, where no one seeks for fortune or renown. I whistled to the birds that flew about, and built a lot of castles in my dreams. I washed away the stains of care and doubt, and thanked the Lord for woods and running streams. I've cooked my meals before an open fire. I've had the joy of green smoke in my face. I've followed for a time my heart's desire, and now the path of duty I retrace. I've had my little fishing trip, and go once more contented to the haunts of men. I'm ready now to hear the whistles blow, and see the roofs and chimney tops again. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To an Old Friend by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Kendra Sanders When we have lived our little lives And wandered all their byways through When we've seen all that we shall see And finished all that we must do When we shall take one backward look Off yonder where our journey ends I pray that you shall be as glad As I shall be that we were friends Time was we started out to find the treasures and the joys of life. We sought them in the land of gold through many days of bitter strife. When we were young we yearned for fame. In search of joy we went afar, only to learn how very cold and distant all the strangers are. When we have met all we shall meet and know what destiny has planned, I shall rejoice in that last hour that I have known your friendly hand. I shall go singing down the way, off yonder as my sun descends, as one who's had a happy life, made glorious by the best of friends. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Satisfied with Life by Edgar A. Guest, read for LibriVox.org, by Tina Marie Cruz. I have known the green trees and the skies overhead, and the blossoms of spring and the fragrance they shed. I have known the blue sea and the mountains afar, and the song of the pines and the light of a star. And should I pass now, I could say with a smile that my pilgrimage here has been well worth my while. I have known the warm handclasp of friends who were true. I have shared in their pleasures and wept with them, too. I have heard the gay laughter which sweeps away care, and none of the comrades I've made could I spare. And should this be all I could say ere I go, that life is worth while just such friendships to know. I have builded a home where we've loved and been glad. I have known the rich joy of a girl and a lad. I have had their caresses through storm and through shine, and watched them grow lovely, those youngsters of mine. And I think as I hold them at night on my knee, that life has been generous surely to me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Autumn Evenings by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Krista Zaleski Apples on the table and the great fire blazing high. Oh, I'm sure the whole world hasn't any happier man than I. The mother sitting mending little stockings toe and knee 
and tell in all that's happened through the busy day to me. Oh, I don't know how to say it, but these cosy autumn nights seem to glow with true contentment and a thousand real delights. The dog sprawled out before me knows that hunting days are here, because he dreams and seems to whimper that a flock of quail are near, and the children playing checkers till it's time to go to bed, calling me to settle questions whether black is beaten red. Oh, these nights are filled with gladness, and I puff my pipe and smile, and I tell myself the struggle and the work are both worth while. The flames are full of pictures that keep dancing to and fro, bringing back the scenes of gladness of the happy long ago. And the whole wide world is silent, and I tell myself just this, that within these walls I cherish, there is all my world there is. Can I keep the love abiding in these hearts so close to me, and the laughter of these evenings I shall gain life's victory? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Memorial Day by Edgar A. Guest, read for LibriVox.org, by Chuck DeSully. These did not pass in selfishness. They died for all mankind. They died to build a better world for all who stay behind. And we who hold their memory dear and bring them flowers today should consecrate ourselves once more to live and die as they. These were defenders of the faith, and guardians of the truth, that you and I might live and love, they gladly gave their youth. And we who set this day apart to honor them who sleep should pledge ourselves to hold the faith they gave their lives to keep. If tears are all we shed for them, then they have died in vain. If flowers are all we bring them now, forgotten they remain. If by their courage we ourselves to courage are not led, then needlessly these graves have closed above our heroes dead. To symbolize our love with flowers is not enough to do. We must be brave as they were brave, and true as they were true. They died to build a better world, and we who mourn today should consecrate ourselves once more to live and die as they. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Happy Man by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Carrie Adams Your Book Voice If you would know a happy man, go find the fellow who Has had a bout with trouble grim, and just comes smiling through. The load is off his shoulders now, where yesterday he frowned And saw no joy in life, today he laughs his way around. He's done the very thing he thought that he could never do. His sun is shining high today, and all his skies are blue. He's stronger than he was before, should trouble come anew. He'll know how much his strength can bear, and how much he can do. Today he has the right to smile, and he may gaily sing, for he has conquered where he feared the pain of failure's sting. Comparison has taught him, too, the sweetest hours are those which follow on the heels of care with laughter and repose. If you would meet a happy man, go find the fellow who has had a bout with trouble grim and just comes smiling through. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Song of the Builder by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by James N. I sink my piers to the solid rock, and I send my steel to the sky, and I pile up the granite block by block, full twenty stories high. Nor wind nor weather shall wash away the thing that I've builded day by day. Here's something of mine that shall ever stand till another shall tear it down. Here is the work of my brain and hand 
towering above the town, and the idlers gay in their smug content, have nothing to leave for a monument. Here from my girders I look below at the throngs which travel by. For little that's real will they leave to show when it comes their time to die. But I, when my time of life is through, will leave this building for men to view. Oh, the work is hard and the days are long, but hammers are tools for men. And granite endures and steel is strong, outliving both brush and pen. And ages after my voice is stilled, men shall know I live by the things I build. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Old Years and New by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Kendra Sanders Old Years and New Years, all blended into one, The best of what there is to be, the best of what is gone. Let's bury all the failures in the dim and dusty past, And keep the smiles of friendship and laughter to the last. Old years and new years, life's in the making still. We haven't come to glory yet, but there's the hope we will. The dead old year was twelve months long, but now from it we're free. And what's one year of good or bad to all the years to be? Old years and new years, we need them one and all, to reach the dome of character and build its sheltering wall. Past failures tried the souls of us, but if their tests we stood, the sum of what we are to be may yet be counted good. Old years and new years, with all their pain and strife, are but the bricks and steel and stone with which we fashion life. So put the sin and shame away, and keep the fine and true, and on the glory of the past let's build a better new. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. When We're All Alike by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Curtis Richardson I've trudged through life's highway up and down. I've watched the lines of men march by. I've seen them in the busy town, and seen them under country sky. I've talked with toilers in the ranks, and walked with men whose hands were white, and learned when closed were stores and banks were nearly all alike at night. Just find the wise professor when he isn't lost in ancient lore, and he, like many other men, romps with his children on the floor. He puts his gravity aside to share an innocent delight, stripped of position's pomp and pride. We're nearly all the same at night. Serving a common cause, we go unto our separate tasks by day. And rich or poor or great or low, regardless of their place or pay, cherish the common dreams of men, a home where love and peace unite. We serve the self-same end and plan. We're all alike when it is night. Each for his loved ones wants to do his utmost. Brothers are we all when we have run the work day through. In romping with our children small, rich men and poor delight in play. When care and caste have taken flight, at home, in all we think and say, we're very much the same at night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Things You Can't Forget by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Winifred Asman They ain't much seen from day to day the big elm tree across the way, the church spire and the meeting place lit up by many a friendly face. You pass em by a dozen times and never think of them in rhymes or fit for poets singing, yet they're all the things you can't forget. 
and they are the things you'll miss some day, if ever you should go away. The people here ain't much to see, just common folks like you and me, doing the ordinary tasks which life of everybody asks. Old Dr. Green, still fair and round, to where his patients can be found. And Parson Hill, serene a face, carrying God's message every place. And Jim, who keeps the grocery store, yet they are folks you'd hunger for. They seem so plain when close to view, Bill Barker and his brother, too. The Jacksons, men of higher rank, because they chance to run the bank. Yet friends to every one round here, quiet and kindly and sincere, not much to sing about or praise, live in their lives in modest ways. Yet in your memory they'd stay, if ever you should go away. These are things, and these the men, some day you'll long to see again. Now it's so near you scarcely see the beauty of that big elm tree. But some day later on you will, and wonder if it's standing still, and if the birds return to sing, and make their nests there every spring. Maybe you scorn them now, but they will bring you back again some day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Making of Friends by Edgar A. Guest, read for LibriVox.org by Winifred Asman. If nobody smiled, and nobody cheered, and nobody helped us along, if each every minute looked after himself, and good things all went to the strong, if nobody cared just a little for you, and nobody thought about me, and we stood all alone to the battle of life, what a dreary old world it would be. If there were no such thing as a flag in the sky, as a symbol of comradeship here, if we lived as the animals live in the woods, with nothing held sacred or dear, and selfishness ruled us from birth to the end, and never a neighbor had we, and never we gave to another in need, what a dreary old world it would be. Oh, if we were rich as the richest on earth, and strong as the strongest that lives, Yet never we knew the delight and the charm of the smile which the other man gives. If kindness were never a part of ourselves, though we owned all the land we could see, and friendship meant nothing at all to us here, what a dreary old world it would be. Life is sweet just because of the friends we have made and the things which in common we share. We want to live on not because of ourselves, but because of the people who care. It's giving and doing for somebody else, on that all life's splendor depends. And the joy of this world, when you've summed it all up, is found in the making of friends. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Deeds of Anger by Edward A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Doty I used to lose my temper and get mad and tear around and raise my voice so women folks would tremble at the sound. I'd do things I was ashamed of when the fit of rage had passed and wish I hadn't done em and regret em to the last. But I've learned from sad experience how useless is regret. For the mean things done in anger are the things you can't forget. Tain't no use to kiss the youngster once your hand has made him cry. You'll recall the time you struck him till the very day you die. He'll forget it and forgive you and tomorrow seem the same. But you'll keep the hateful picture of your sorrow and your shame. And it's bound to rise to taunt you, though you long have squared the debt. For the things you've done in meanness are the things you can't forget. Lord, I sometimes sit and shudder when some scene comes back to me which shows me big and brutal in some act of tyranny. When some trifling thing upset me and I let my temper fly and was sorry for it after, but it's vain to sit and sigh. So I'd be a whole sight happier now my sun begins to set if it wasn't for the meanness which I've done and can't forget. Now I think I've learned my lesson and I'm treading gentler ways and I try to build my mornings into happy yesterdays. 
I don't let my temper spoil him in the way I used to do, and let some splash of anger smear the record when it's through. I want my memories pleasant, free from shame or vain regret, without any deeds of anger, which I never can forget. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. I'd Rather Be a Failure by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone I'd rather be a failure than the man who never tried. I'd rather seek the mountain top than always stand aside. Oh, let me hold some lofty dream and make my desperate fights and though I fail, I still shall know I tried to serve the right. The idlers line the ways of life, and they are quick to sneer. They note the falling strength of man, and greet it with a jeer. But there is something deep inside, which scoffers fail to view. They never see the glorious deed the failure tried to do. Some men there are who never leave the city's well-worn streets. They never know the dangers grim the bold adventurer meets. They never seek a better way, nor serve a nobler plan. They never risk with failure to advance the cause of man. Oh, better tis to fail and fall in sorrow and despair, then stand where all is safe and sure, and never face a care. Yes, stamp me with a failure's brand, and let men sneer at me. For though I failed, the Lord shall know the man I tried to be. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Couldn't Live Without You by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Krista Zaleski You're just a little fellow with a lot of funny ways. Just three foot six of mischief set with eyes that fairly blaze. You're always up to something with those busy hands of yours, and you leave a trail of ruin on the walls and on the doors. And I wonder as I watch you and your curious tricks I see, whatever is the reason that you mean so much to me? You're just a chubby rascal with a grin upon your face, just seven years of gladness and a hard and trying case. You think the world's your playground, and in all you say and do, you fancy everybody ought to bow and scrape to you. Dull care's a thing you laugh at just as though twill never be. So I wonder, little fellow, why you mean so much to me. Now your face is smeared with candy, or perhaps it's only dirt, and it's really most alarming how you tear your little shirt. But I have to smile upon you, and with all your willful ways, I'm certain that I need you round about me all my days. Yes, I've got to have you with me, for somehow it's come to be that I couldn't live without you, for you're all the world to me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Just a Boy by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by James N. Get to understand the lad. He's not eager to be bad. If the right he always knew, he would be as old as you. Were he now exceeding wise, he'd be just about your size. When he does things that annoy, don't forget, he's just a boy. Could he know and understand, he would need no guiding hand, but he's young and hasn't learned how life's corners must be turned. Doesn't know from day to day there is more in life than play, more to face than selfish joy. Don't forget he's just a boy. Being just a boy he'll do, much you will not want him to. He'll be careless of his ways, have his disobedient days, willful, wild, and headstrong too just as when a boy were you. Things of value he'll destroy, but reflect he's just a boy. Just a boy who needs a friend, patient kindly to the end, 
needs a father who will show him the things he wants to know. Take him with you when you walk. Listen when he wants to talk. His companionship and joy. Don't forget, he's just a boy. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. What Homes Intended For by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Krista Zaleski When the young folks gather round in the good old-fashioned way, singing all the latest songs gathered from the newest play, or they start the phonograph and shove the chairs back to the wall and hold a little party dance, I'm happiest of all. Then I sort of settle back, plumb contented to the core, and I tell myself most profoundly, that's what home's intended for. When the laughter's gaily ringin' and the home is filled with song, I like to sit and watch em, all that glad and merry thong. For the ragtime they are playin' on the old piano there beats any high-toned music where the bright lights shine and glare. And the racket they are making stirs my pulses more and more, so I whisper in my gladness, that's what home's intended for. Then I smile and say to mother, let him move the chairs about, let him frolic in the parlour, let him shove the tables out. Just so long as they are near us, just so long as they will stay, by the fireplace we are keepin', harm will never come their way. And you'll never hear me grumble at the bills that keep me poor. It's the finest part of livin', that's what home's intended for. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Safe at Home by Edgar A. Guest, read for LibriVox.org by Rachel Bishop. Let the old fire blaze and the youngsters shout and the dog on the rug sprawl full length out and mother and I sort of settle down and it's little we care for the noisy town. Oh, it's little we care that the wind may blow and the streets grow white with the drifted snow. We'll face the storm with the break of day, but tonight we'll dream and we'll sing and play. We'll sit by the fire where it's snug and warm and pay no heed to the winter storm. With a sheltering roof, let the blizzard roar. We are safe at home. Can a king say more? That's all that counts when the day is done, the smiles of love and the youngsters' fun. The cares put down with the evening gloam. Here's the joy of all, to be safe at home. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. When Friends Drop In by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Ben Dowling It may be I'm old-fashioned, but the times I like the best Are not the splendid parties with the women gaily dressed And the music tuned for dancing and the laughter of the throng with a paid comedian's antics or a hired musician's song. But the quiet times of friendship with the chuckles and the grin, and the circle at the fireside when a few good friends drop in. There's something round the fireplace that no club can imitate, and no throng can ever equal just a few folks near the gate. Though I sometimes like an opera, there's no music quite so sweet as the singing of the neighbors that you're always glad to meet. Oh, I know when they come calling that the fun will soon begin, and I'm the happiest of those evenings when a few good friends drop in. There's no pomp of preparation, there's no style or sham or fuss. We are glad to welcome callers who are glad to be with us. And we sit around and visit, or we start a merry game, and we show them by our manner that we're mighty pleased they came. For there's something real about it, and the yarns we love to spin, and the time flies oh so swiftly when a few good friends drop in. Let me live my life among them, cheerful, kindly folks and true, and I'll ask no greater glory till my time of life is through. Let me share the love and favor of the few who know me best, and I'll spend my time contented until my sun sinks in the west. I will take what fortune sends me and the little I may win, and be happy on those evenings when a few good friends drop in. End of poem.
This recording is in the public domain. The Book of Memory by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Tina Marie Cruz Turn me loose and let me be, young once more and fancy free. Let me wander where I will, down the lane and up the hill. Trudging barefoot in the dust, in an age that knows no must, and no voice insistently speaks of duty unto me. Let me tread the happy ways of those bygone yesterdays. Fame had never whispered then, making slaves of eager men. Greed had never called me down to the gray walls of the town. Offering frankincense and myrrh, if I'd be its prisoner, I was free to come and go where the cherry blossoms blow, free to wander where I would, finding life supremely good. But I turn, as all must do, from the happiness I knew, to the land of care and strife, seeking for a fuller life, heard the lore of fame and sought, that renown so dearly bought, listened to the voice of greed, saying, These the things you need, now the great town holds me fast, prisoner to the very last. Age has stamped me as its own, youth to younger hearts has flown. Still the cherry blossoms blow, in the land Laos to know, Still the fragrant clover spills, perfume over dells and hills. But I'm not allowed to stray, where the young are free to play. All the years will grant to me is the book of memory. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pretending Not to See by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Patrick Randall Sometimes at the table, when he gets misbehavin', then mother calls across to me, Look at him now, don't you see what he's doin' sprawlin' there? Make him sit up in his chair. Don't you see the messy way that he's eating? And I say, No, he seems all right just now. What's he doin' anyhow? Mother placed him there by me and she thinks I ought to see every time he breaks the laws and correct him, just because there will come a time some day when he mustn't act that way. But I can't be all along scolding him for doing wrong, so if something goes astray, I just look the other way. Mother tells me now and then I'm the easiest of men, and in dealing with the lad, I will never see the bad that he does. And I suppose mother's right, for mother knows. But I'd hate to feel that I'm here to scold him all the time. Little faults might spoil the day. So I look the other way. Look the other way and try not to let him catch my eye. Knowing all the time that he doesn't mean so bad to be. Knowing, too, that now and then I am not the best of men. Hoping, too, the times I fall, that the Father of us all, loving, watching over me, will pretend he doesn't see. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Joys of Home by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Curtis Richardson Curling smoke from a chimney low And only a few more steps to go Faces pressed at a window pane Watching for someone to come again And I am the someone they wait to see These are the joys life gives to me What has my neighbor excelling this? A good wife's love and the baby's kiss. What if his chimneys tower high? Peace is found at our humble fire. What if his silver and gold are more? Rest is ours when the day is o'er. Strive for fortune and slave for fame. You find that joy always stays the same. Rich man and poor man dream and pray. For a home where laughter shall ever stay. And the wheels go round and men spend their might. 
for the few glad hours they might claim at night. Home, where the kettle shall gaily sing, is all that matters with serf or king. Gold and silver and laureled fame are only sweet when the hearth's aflame. With a cheerful fire and the loved ones there are unafraid of the wolves of care. So let me come home at night to rest with those who know I have done my best. Let the wife rejoice and my children smile, and I'll know by their love that I am worthwhile. For this is conquest and world success, a home where abideth happiness. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. We Are Dreamers All by Edgar A. Guest, read for LibriVox.org by Rachel Bishop. O oh, man must dream of gladness wherever his pathways lead, and a hint of something better is written in every creed. And nobody wakes at morning but hopes ere the day is o'er to have come to a richer pleasure than ever he's known before. For man is a dreamer ever, he glimpses the hills afar, and plans for the joys off yonder where all his tomorrows are. When trials and cares beset him, in the distance he still can see, a hint of a future splendid and the glory that is to be. There is never a man among us but cherishes dreams of rest. We toil for that something better than that which is now our best. Oh, what if the cup be bitter, and what if we're racked with pain? There are wonderful days to follow when never we'll grieve again. Back of the sound of the hammer, and back of the hissing steam, and back of the hand at the throttle is ever a lofty dream. All of us, great or humble, look over the present need to the dawn of the glad tomorrow, which is promised in every creed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. What is Success? by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Tina Marie Cruz Success is being friendly when another needs a friend. It's in the cheery words you speak and in the coins you lend. Success is not alone in skill and deeds of daring great. It's in the roses that you plant beside your garden gate. Success is in the way you walk the paths of life each day. It's in the little things you do and in the things you say. Success is in the glad hello you give your fellow man. It's in the laughter of your home and all the joys you plan. Success is not in getting rich or rising high to fame. It's not alone in winning goals which all men hope to claim. It's in the man you are each day through happiness or care. It's in the cheery words you speak and in the smile you wear. Success is being big of heart and clean and broad of mind. It's being faithful to your friends and to the stranger kind. It's in the children whom you love and all they learn from you. Success depends on character and everything you do. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Three Me's by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by James N. I'd like to steal it day and be All alone with little me Little me that used to run everywhere in search of fun. Little me of long ago, who was glad and didn't know. Life is freighted down with care for the backs of men to bear. Little me who thought a smile ought to linger all the while on his mother's pretty face, and a tear should never trace lines of sorrow, hurt, or care on those cheeks so wondrous fair. I should like once more to be all alone with youthful me, youthful me who saw the hills where the sun its splendor spills, and was certain that in time to the topmost height he'd climb, youthful me serene of soul who beheld a shining goal, and imagined he could gain glory without grief or pain, confident and quick with life, madly eager for the strife, knowing not that bitter care waited for his coming there i should like to sit alone with the me now older grown like to lead the little me and the youth that used to be once again along the ways of our glorious yesterdays 
We could chuckle soft and low at the things we didn't know, and could laugh to think how bold we had been in days of old, and how blind we were to care with its heartache and despair. We could smile away the tears and the pain of later years. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Brothers All by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org By Curtis Richardson Brothers All Under the toiler's grimy shirt Under the sweat and the grease and dirt Under the rough outside you view Is a man who thinks and feels as you Go talk with him Go walk with him Sit down with him by a running stream Away from the things that are hissing steam, Away from his bench, his hammer and wrench, And the grind of need, and the sordid deed, And this you'll find, as he bears his mind, And the things which count when his life is through, He's as tender and big and as good as you. Be fair with him, and share with him, An hour of time in a restful place, brother to brother, and face to face, and he'll whisper low of the long ago, of a loved one dead, and the tears he shed, and you'll come to see that in suffering he, with you, is hurt by the self-same rod, and turns for help to the self-same God. You hope as he, you dream of splendors, and so does he. His children must be as you'd have yours be. He shares your love for the flag above. He laughs and sings for the self-same things. When he's understood, he is mostly good, thoughtful of others and kind and true, brave, devoted, and much like you. Under the toiler's grimy shirt, under the sweat and the grease and dirt, under the rough outside you view is a man who thinks and feels as you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. When We Understand the Plan by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by James N. I reckon when the world we leave and cease to smile and cease to grieve, when each of us shall quit the strife and drop the working tools of life, somewhere somehow we'll come to find just what our Maker had in mind. Perhaps through clearer eyes than these we'll read life's hidden mysteries and learn the reason for our tears why sometimes came unhappy years and why our dearest joys were brief and bound so closely unto grief. There is so much beyond our scope, as blindly on through life we grope. So much we cannot understand, however wisely we have planned, that all who walk this earth about are constantly beset by doubt. No one of us can truly say why loved ones must be called away, why hearts are hurt or even explained, why some must suffer years of pain. Yet some day all of us shall know the reason why these things are so. I reckon in the years to come, when these poor lips of clay are dumb, and these poor hands have ceased to toil, somewhere upon a fairer soil, God shall to all of us make clear the purpose of our trials here. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This Spoiler by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Allegra Little Cole. The Spoiler With a twinkle in his eye, he'd come gaily walking by, And he'd whistle to the children, and he'd beckon him to come, Then he'd chuckle low and say, Come along, I'm on my way, And it's I that need your company to buy a little gum. Then his merry call they'd hear, All the children far and near, Would come flying from the gardens like chickens after wheat, When we'd shake our heads and say, No, you mustn't go today, He'd beg to let him have him in a pack about his feet. Oh, he'd spoil him one and all, there was not a youngster small, 
but was overfed on candy and was stuffed with lollipops, and I think his greatest joy was to bring some girl or boy and bring him to their parents all besmeared by chocolate drops. Now the children's hearts are sore, for he comes to them no more, and no more to them he whistles, and no more for them he stops. But in paradise, I think, with his chuckle and his wink, he is leading little angels to heavenly candy shops. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Vanished Joy by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Patrick Randall When I was but a little lad of six and seven and eight, one joy I knew that has been lost in customs up to date. Then Saturday was baking day, and mother used to make, the while I stood about and watched, the Sunday pies and cake. And I was there to have fulfilled a small boy's fondest wish, the glorious privilege of youth, to scrape the frosting dish. On Saturdays I never left to wander far away. I hovered near the kitchen door on Mother's baking day. The fragrant smell of cooking seemed to hold me in its grip, and naught cared I for other sports while there were sweets to sip. I little cared that all my chums had sought the brook to fish. I chose to wait that moment glad when I could scrape the dish. Full many a slice of apple I have lifted from a pie before the upper crust went on, escaping mother's eye. Full many a time my fingers small in artfulness have strayed into some sweet temptation rare which mother's hands had made. But eager-eyed and watery-mouthed I craved the greater boon when mother let me clean the dish and lick the frosting spoon. The baking days of old are gone. Our children cannot know the glorious joys that childhood owned and loved so long ago. New customs change the lives of all, and in their heartless way they've robbed us of the glad event once known as baking day. The stores provide our every need. Yet many a time I wish our kids could know that bygone thrill and scrape the frosting dish. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Carry On by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by James N. They spoke it bravely, grimly, in their darkest hours of doubt. They spoke it when their hope was low and when their strength gave out. We heard it from the dying in those troubled days now gone, and they breathed it as their slogan for the living, Carry On. Now the days of strife are over, and the skies are fair again. But those two brave words of courage on our lips should still remain. And the trials which beset us, and the cares we look upon, to our dead we should be faithful. We have still to carry on. Carry on through storm and danger. Carry on through dark despair. Carry on through hurt and failure. Carry on through grief and care. Twas the slogan they bequeathed us as they fell beside the way, and for them and for our children, let us carry on today. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Life's Single Standard by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by James N. There are a thousand ways to cheat and a thousand ways to sin. There are ways uncounted to lose the game, but there's only one way to win. 
And whether you live by the sweat of your brow or in luxury's garb you're dressed, you shall stand at last when your race is run to be judged by the single test. Some men lie by the things they make, some lie in the deeds they do, and some play false for a woman's love, and some for a cheer or two. Some rise to fame by the force of skill, grow great by the might of power, then wreck the temple they toiled to build in a single shameful hour. The follies outnumber the virtues good, sin lures in a thousand ways, but slow is the growth of man's character, and patience must mark his days. For only those victories shall count when the work of life is done, which bear the stamp of an honest man, and by courage and faith were won. There are a thousand ways to fail, but only one way to win. Shame cannot cover the wrong you do, nor wash out a single sin. And never shall victory come to you, whatever of skill you do, save you've done your best in the work of life, and unto your best were true. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Learn to Smile by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Carrie Adams, Your Book Voice The good Lord understood us when he taught us how to smile. He knew we couldn't stand it to be solemn all the while. He knew he'd have to shape us so that when our hearts were gay, we could let our neighbors know it in a quick and easy way. So he touched the lips of Adam, and he touched the lips of Eve, and he said, Let these be solemn, when your sorrows make you grieve. But when all is well in Eden, and your life seems worth the while, let your faces wear the glory and the sunshine of a smile. Teach the symbol to your children, pass it down through all the years, Though they know their share of sadness, and shall weep their share of tears, Through the ages men and women shall prove their faith in me, By the smile upon their faces, when their hearts are trouble-free. The good Lord understood us when he sent us down to earth, He knew our need for laughter and for happy signs of mirth, He knew we couldn't stand it to be solemn all the while, but must share our joy with others, so he taught us how to smile. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The True Man by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by James N. This is the sort of man was he. True when it hurt him a lot to be. Tight in a corner and knowing a lie would have helped him out, but he wouldn't buy his freedom there in so cheap a way. He told the truth, though he had to pay. Honest not in the easy sense, when he needn't worry about expense. We'll all play square when it doesn't count, and the sum at stake's not a large amount. But he was square when the times were bad, and keeping his word took all he had. Honor is something we all profess, but most of us cheat, some more, some less. And the real test isn't the way we do when there isn't a pinch in either shoe. It's whether we're true to our best or not, when the right thing's certain to hurt a lot. That is the sort of man was he. Straight when it hurt him a lot to be. Times when a lie would have paid him well, no matter the cost, the truth he'd tell. And he'd rather go down to a drab defeat than save himself if he had to cheat. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Cleaning the Furnace by Edgar A. Guest. Read for LibriVox.org by Chuck DeSoli. Last night, Pa said to Ma, My dear, it's getting on to fall. It's time I did a little job I do not like at all. I wished that I was rich enough to hire a man to do the dirty work around this house and clean up when he's through. 
But since I'm not, I'm truly glad that I'm strong and stout, and ain't ashamed to go myself and clean the furnace out. Then after supper, Pa put on his overalls and said, He'd work down in the cellar till it was time to go to bed. He started in to rattle and to bang and poke and stir, and the dust began a climbing up through every register, till Ma said, Goodness gracious, go and shut those things up tight, or we'll all be suffocated, and the house will be a sight. Then he carted out the ashes in a basket and a pail, and from cellar door to alley he just left an ashy trail. Then he pulled apart the chimney, and twas full of something black, and he skinned most all his knuckles when he tried to put it back. We could hear him talking awful, and Ma looked at us and said, I think it would be better if you children went to bed. When he came up from the cellar, there were ashes in his hair. There were ashes in his eyebrows, but he didn't seem to care. There were ashes in his mustache. There were ashes in his eyes. And we never would have known him if he took us by surprise. Well, I gotta clean, he sputtered. And Ma said, I guess that's true. Once the dirt was in the furnace, but now most of it's on you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Trouble Brings Friends by Edgar A. Guest Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson It's seldom trouble comes alone. I've noticed this. When things go wrong and trouble comes a visitin', it always brings a friend along. Sometimes it's one you've known before, and then perhaps it's someone new, who stretches out a helping hand and stops to see what he can do. If never trials came to us, if grief and sorrow passed us by, if every day the sun came out and clouds were never in the sky, we'd still have neighbors, I suppose, each one pursuing selfish ends. But only neighbors they would be. We'd never know them as our friends. Out of the troubles I have had have come my richest friendships here. Kind hands have helped to bear my care. Kind words have fallen on my ear. And so I say when trouble comes, I know before the storm shall end that I shall find my bit of care has also brought to me a friend. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of When Day is Done by Edgar A. Guest